Hello, everyone. I think we can get started. Good morning. Uh, I am Sean McGuire, State Water Board member, and today is Wednesday, January 5th, 2022 at 9 a.m., and I would like to call this workshop to order. I'll begin by introducing uh, my fellow board members. Uh, with me today are my colleagues, board member Laurel Firestone and board member Nicole Morgan. Vice Chair uh, Doreen Diadama will be joining us a little bit later this morning. And our board chair, Joaquin Estevel, will not be attending today, although I'm sure he'll be monitoring the workshop as it goes. Supporting the board today uh, is our board executive staff, executive director, Aileen Sobeck, chief counsel, Michael Laufer, chief deputy directors, Jonathan Bishop and Eric Oppenheimer, and the clerk to the board, Janine Townsend, and assisting her are Courtney Tyler and Margie Argyll. I also want you to know that this workshop is being webcasted and recorded. So when you speak, please say your name clearly into your phone or your microphone on your computer. Also, as a result of the COVID-19 emergency that we're all very familiar with, we are conducting today's board meet workshop versus via uh, teleconference, as you can see. In order to comply with public gathering limitations, and physical distancing requirements, and as authorized by the governor's executive orders, there is no physical meeting room. For people who only want to listen or watch the meeting, the board's webcast on the Cal EPA website or our YouTube channel are available for you. We are receiving presentations and public comment through Zoom. And if you intend to present or comment, uh, or you think you might be interested in commenting today, you should already be in the Zoom meeting room using the meeting ID provided on the board's website and the password you received from the clerk. If you've not already received a password, you can email the clerk right now at commentletters at waterboards.ca.gov and she will email you a link to sign up on the virtual speaker card list. For those in the Zoom meeting, you will be on mute and your camera turned off until it's your turn to speak. The clerk will then unmute you and ask you to turn on your camera if you have one. When you're done speaking and the board members have completed asking questions, you'll be placed on mute and your camera turned off. And with that out of the way, I think we can move on to our only item for today, which is our workshop, which is agenda item number six. And I'm going to start, I have a, a, a few comments to, and statement to make here, so I will read this to you. So this is a public workshop to receive verbal comments on two state water board related, uh, drought related actions. The first concerns a draft order that addresses petitions for reconsideration of two decisions that were made last year by the executive director. Those were an order approving a 2021 temporary urgency change petition to modify conditions of state water board decision 1641 that required the state water project and central valley project to be operated to meet certain delta water quality objectives and an approval of the 2021 Sacramento River temperature management plan pursuant to state water board order 90-5 for the operation of Shasta Reservoir. These, those two approvals are discussed in the same draft order on reconsideration because part of the reason for the temporary urgency change petition was to help preserve water in Shasta Reservoir for temperature management. And many commenters have addressed both approvals in relation to each other. The draft order addresses whether the, whether the decisions by the executive director were justified based on the knowledge available at the time and if modifications should be made to those decisions to improve future drought management. The second item on today's agenda is consideration of a pending temporary urgency change petition to modify requirements imposed pursuant to decision 1641 that govern operation of the state water project and central valley project if dry hydrology persists in 2022. We are including both of these actions in the same public workshop because each involves requirements or potential changes to requirements imposed upon the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project in response to drought conditions. And we wanted to extend the courtesy to members of the public to be able to discuss either or both in the same set of comments today. We are not taking action today, only receiving and listening to verbal public comments. And at first we'll hear several presentations to be to introduce the workshop in advance of public comments. 
State Water Board staff will provide a summary of the Executive Director's 2021 to UCP order, the Executive Director's 2021 Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan approval, the draft order regarding petitions for reconsideration of these Executive Director approvals, and information on the 2022 TUCP public comment process and next steps. Next, a hydrologic and forecasting update from the Department of Water Resources climatologists will be provided. Uh, that will be followed by a presentation from operations staff from the California Department of Water Resources and United States Bureau of Reclamation will provide an overview of the 2022 TUCP and an update on the request in light of the current hydrologic conditions. Finally, uh, DWR Delta monitoring staff will summarize findings from studies evaluating the status of aquatic weeds and harmful algal blooms in the Delta in 2021, pursuant to requirements of the Executive Director's 2021 TUCP approval. Uh, present, we may also be hearing some additional agency comments. Uh, presentations will be followed by an opportunity for ver verbal public comment by participants in today's workshop. Written public comments on the draft order regarding petitions for reconsideration and the 2022 TUCP are due to the State Water Board by noon this Friday, January 7, 2022. I want to emphasize again that no decision on the proposed draft order regarding petitions for reconsideration or the 2022 TUCP will be made today as this is a workshop to receive public comment on these two proposed and potential state water board actions. While the substance of today's workshop is focused on two separate state water board actions, these actions are related drought response responses and we are providing the opportunity to comment on both today in recognition that each drought experience is an opportunity to learn and improve and apply lessons to future actions. What will be most helpful today is to hear public comments regarding how the State Water Board can improve its response to low water supply conditions in the future and this year, especially actions that can improve protection of beneficial uses that can suffer the most during drought cycles, including safe, contaminant-free local waterways, safe drinking water supplies, swimming and fishing for urban and rural communities, and improved protection for commercial, ecological, and culturally important fish populations. And with that, I am going to turn the presentation over to staff. Thank you, board member McGuire. My name is Diane Riddle. I am one of the assistant deputy directors in the Division of Water Rights. I will introduce the staff presentation today and then turn it over to Aaron Forsman to complete the staff presentation. We'll then turn it over to staff from the Department of Water Resources and Bureau of Reclamation to cover the topics that board member McGuire identified. Next slide, please. I'll start by providing a brief overview of the topics we plan to discuss today. First, I'll start with some brief background to provide context for today's workshop, including some background on drought conditions and the associated proclamation from the governor that relate to today's workshop. I'll then provide a brief overview of the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan, um, Decision 1641 that implements that water quality control plan, or D1641 for short, the, as well as the 2021 Temporary Urgency Change Petition, or TUCP for short. I'll then provide a summary of State Water Board Order 90-5 um, that includes Sacramento River temperature management requirements and the associated 2021 Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan. I'll then turn it over to Aaron to discuss the Executive Director's response to the 2021 TUCP and Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan, the petitions for reconsideration of those decisions and the draft order responding to the petitions. Aaron will also provide a brief summary of the 2022 TUCP and timeline. However, we have staff from DWR and Reclamation here today to provide more detail on that petition. 
Finally, Aaron will summarize the comment process for both the order on reconsideration and the 2022 TFCP and the next steps for those processes. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on the drought conditions. We've heard a lot about those um, over the past year or so. Um, just briefly um, to remind everyone, 2020 and 2021 were the driest two-year period on record for the state of California with well below average precipitation in the state. In addition to the low precipitation, there was also a significant reduction in expected runoff due to dry soils and warm conditions. As the drought conditions evolved during the spring and summer of 2021, the governor took various actions to respond to the dry conditions, including issuing four proclamations of a state of emergency due to drought conditions, eventually covering all of the counties of the state. The May 10th 2021 proclamation included the counties of the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta watershed. That proclamation specifically included provisions for the temporary urgency change petitions to conserve water and upstream, reservoirs for later in the year to protect water pools, improve water quality, protect carryover storage, and ensure minimum human health and safety water supplies. Ordinarily, the State Water Board must comply with the California Environmental Quality Act prior to issuance of a temporary urgency change order. The May 10th drought proclamation waived the California Environmental Quality Act requirements for the TUCP. The governor's proclamation also suspended Water Code Section 13247 for the TUCP, requiring state agencies, including the State Water Board, to comply with water quality control plans. Absent suspension of section 13247, the board could not approve a petition to modify decision 1641 requirements in a way that did not provide for full attainment of the Bay Delta Plan's water quality objectives. The drought proclamation also included provisions for other actions, including curtailments of water rights when water is not available under water, under water right holders priority of right and to protect previously stored water released to meet downstream needs, including salinity control. Um, the State Water Board did adopt curtailment regulations and issued curtailment orders for the Delta watershed starting in August. The extreme dry conditions of 2021 and 2022 persisted through September of 2021. Um, however, two large atmospheric rivers occurring in October and December substantially improved hyd hydrologic conditions increasing reservoir storage and building a snowpack that is about 150% of average to date. DWR climatologists will provide additional information on the current hydrologic conditions following this presentation. Next slide, please. Um, I'll provide a little bit of background on the Bay Delta Plan and Decision 1641 that were the subject of the temporary urgency change petition. Uh, the Bay Delta Plan identifies beneficial uses of water, water quality objectives for the reasonable protection of those uses, a program of implementation to achieve the objectives, as well as monitoring and special studies. The Bay Delta Plan includes municipal and industrial beneficial uses, agricultural beneficial uses, and fish and wildlife beneficial uses, as well as water quality objectives to reasonably protect those uses. The water quality objectives in the, in the Bay Delta Plan are primarily flow dependent and, complete, and include both narrative and numeric objectives. The program of implementation includes flow and non-flow actions by the board and other agencies. State Water Board Decision 1641 or D1641 includes water right requirements to implement the Bay Delta Plan. As a result of various agreements, D1641 places primary responsibilities on the water rights of the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project held by the Department of Water Resources and Bureau of Reclamation, uh, respectively for meeting the Sacramento and San Joaquin River inflow requirements, Delta outflow requirements, Delta salinity requirements, and project operational objectives in the Bay Delta plan. Next slide, please. Now I'll briefly provide a summary of the temporary urgency change petition that we received last year. DWR and Reclamation submitted that temporary urgency change petition on May 17th in response to the very dry conditions and depleted reservoir storage conditions due to concerns 
related to polar pool protection um, and maintaining health and safety water supplies and salinity control in the Delta. The temporary agency change petition requested modifications to Delta outflow requirements for the protection of fish and wildlife from June 1st through July 31st. Movement of the Western Delta salinity requirement for the protection of agriculture from Emmeton to Three Mile Slough on the Sacramento River, which allows that salinity requirement to move upstream approximately 2.5 miles. The temporary urgency change petition also identified um, that a modification to export limits um, when the changes in the TUCP were in effect, the export limits would be limited to 1500 CFS. When the TUCP was submitted, it was estimated that it would conserve 60 to 120,000 acre feet of water in upstream reservoirs um, for the uses I mentioned before, as well as assist with maintaining salinity control in the Delta. Next slide, please. I'll just briefly summarize the requirements for a temporary urgency change petition um, for context for both the 2021 TUCP and the 2022 TUCP. Water code section 1435 allows the state water board to approve temporary urgency changes and water right requirements. If it finds that the temporary change is necessary to allow the water to be used to its fullest extent. However, before approving a temporary urgency change petition, the state water board must make the following findings. The findings that the permittee or licensee has an urgent need to make the change, the proposed change may be made without injury to other lawful users of water, the change may be made without unreasonable impacts on fish, wildlife, or other in-stream beneficial uses, and the change is in the public interest. Next slide, please. Now I'll provide some background information related to the Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan. Um, water right order 90-5 includes requirements on reclamations permits and license for Keswick Dam, Shasta Dam, and the, spring, and, and the Spring Creek Power Plant on the Sacramento River to partially implement water quality objectives in the Sacramento River. Order 90-5 requires reclamation to maintain a daily average water temperature of 56 degrees Fahrenheit at the Red Bluff Diversion Dam, which is 60 miles downstream of Keswick Dam, to provide protection for aquatic habitat conditions for native fish spawning, rearing, and migration. If there are factors beyond reclamation's reasonable control that prevent it from meeting the 56, de 56 degree requirement at Red Bluff, then reclamation is required to prepare prepare a temperature management plan in consultation with Fish and Wildlife Agencies and the Western Area Power Administration. That plan is then required to be submitted to the board for consideration. The temperature management plan must identify an alternate temperature compliance location and describe reclamation's methods for meeting the temperature requirement at the new compliance location during time periods necessary to protect native salmonids. Next slide, please. With respect to uh, issues related to implementation of order 90-5 in 2021, the Bureau of Reclamation submitted a draft Sac Sacramento River temperature management plan on May 5th as required by order 90-5 the draft temperature management plan identified that reclamation determined a temperature value of 56 degrees Fahrenheit at Red Bluff diversion dam could not reasonably be maintained due to poor storage conditions and predicted dry hydrology and proposed an alternate compliance location and temperature level of 55 degrees Fahrenheit on the Sacramento River at Highway 44 bridge, which is 55 miles upstream of Red Bluff diversion dam. On May 21st, the executive director informed reclamation that she could not approve a final temperature management plan unless it included an end of September carryover storage level for Shasta Reservoir of at least 1.25 million acre feet, as well as a description of deliveries and operations for Shasta and Keswick Reservoir that will achieve the carryover storage level, avoiding impacts to other 
Central Valley Project and State Water Project reservoirs, as well as um, reporting uh, regarding any inability to meet the temperature criteria, and as well as real-time management and consultation with other agencies. A final temperature management plan was submitted on May 28th that included the criteria identified by the executive director in her May 21st letter. Um, with that, that provides the background for um, today's discussion. I'll turn it over to Erin to provide more information regarding the executive director's decisions and the draft order on reconsideration of their information. Thank you. So good morning. Good morning, board member McGuire and board members. My name is Erin Forsman and I'm an environmental program manager in the Division of Water Rights. As Diane mentioned, I will provide an overview of the draft order on reconsideration that is out for public comment currently in one of the subjects of today's workshop. My overview will include summaries of the June 1st, 2021 TUCP order, the June 10th, 2021 Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan approval, and public comments on these actions, including petitions for reconsideration. The TUCP order and the Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan are separate but related actions. The Sacramento River is the largest tributary to the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, and both are essential habitat for native migratory fish. Shasta Reservoir on the Sacramento River is the largest project reservoir and is used with other facilities to meet requirements in D1641. As mentioned in opening remarks, one of the purposes of the TUCP and TUCP order was to preserve reservoir storage, including in Shasta Reservoir. Compliance with the Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan is also a condition of the TUCP order. Accordingly, the draft order addresses public comments and petitions for reconsideration of both executive director decisions on the TUCP order and the Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan. Next slide. The executive director conditionally approved the May 17, 2021 temporary urgency change petition on June 1st, 2021. Conditions included in the cons oh, sorry, conditions included consultations on real-time operations, enhanced reporting, implementation of the Sacramento River TMP, analysis of ecological impacts and impacts on aquatic weeds and harmful algal blooms, and drought planning for water year 2022. During the June 1st through 15th term of the TUCP order, salinity control was maintained primarily in the Delta. However, the modified salinity requirement at three miles slough was exceeded for 17 days from June 28 to, June 4 to July 14, and other Delta salinity requirements and San Joaquin River flow requirements that were not part of the TUCP were also not achieved to varying degrees during 2021. Compliance with the modified Delta outflow requirement of 3,000 CFS and the export limit of 1,500 CFS was maintained with exports frequently far below the 1,500 CFS limit. In response to enhanced reporting requirements in the TUCP order, DWR and Reclamation estimated that 289,000 acre feet of storage was conserved in Shasta Reservoir as a result of the modifications to Delta outflow and Western Delta salinity requirements approved in the TUCP order. Next slide. On June 10th, 2021, the executive director conditionally approved the final Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan or TMP. Conditions included actions to reduce temperature dependent mortality to the extent feasible, achieve the end of September storage goal, weekly consultations, monitoring, modeling, and reporting, and drought and temperature planning for 2022. As part of enhanced reporting required by the executive director approval, Reclamation informed the State Water Board one month after approval of the Sacramento River TMP that Reclamation would not be able to achieve the end of September storage target of 1.25 million acre feet and anticipated that end of September storage in Shasta Reservoir would be 1.1 million acre feet. On October 1st, 2021, end of September storage for Shasta Reservoir was reported to be 1,000, sorry, 1,074,380 acre feet. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes the details regarding petitions for reconsideration and the requirements 
and um, circumstances under which petitions can be filed. So any interested person may file a petition for reconsideration of an order or decision made under authority delegated to an office or employee of the State Water Board pursuant to Water Code Section 1122 and the California Code of Regulations titled Title 23, Sections 768 through 770. Section 768 of the regulation provides that an interested person may petition for reconsideration based on the following causes, irregularity in the proceedings or any ruling or abuse of discretion. The decision or order is not supported by substantial evidence. There is a relevant evidence, there is relevant evidence which could not have been produced or there is an error in law. On reconsideration, the board may do the following. Refuse to reconsider this, the decision or order if the petition fails to raise substantial issues. Deny the petition upon a finding that the decision or order was appropriate and proper. Set aside or modify the decision or order or take another appropriate action. Next slide. Petitions for reconsideration were submitted on both the executive director's conditional approval of the 2021 TUCP and her conditional approval of the Sacramento River TMP. There were a total of 21 written public comments on the 2021 TUCP order and five petitions for reconsideration, and a total of five written public comments and two petitions for reconsideration of the TMP approval. While these two actions are separate, as we've discussed and mentioned several times, these actions are closely related to one another. Accordingly, the draft order on reconsideration addresses both decisions. Next slide. These next two slides contain a summary of the major comment themes on both the TUCP order and the Sacramento River TMP, and I'll go through them quickly. Um, one of the themes was that the Actions created an unreasonable impact to multiple populations of native fish with high extinction risk, that the actions repeat the mistakes of 2014-2015 and intensifies damage to native fish populations, that poor reservoir management and lack of drought planning is not in the public interest and does not justify relaxation of water quality objectives, sorry, water quality requirements that the actions are a subsidy for a small number of high volume agricultural water users, prioritizing their use over public trust, fish and wildlife, municipal and other agricultural uses. That Delta exports of 1500 CFS are much greater than health and safety needs. Exports reduce reservoir storage and unreasonably impact native fish and injured Delta users. But the executive director does not have authority to limit or revise export limits or require compliance with the Sacramento River TMP. Next slide. Other comments came in the theme of the State Water Board already determined that the purpose and use of the projects are in the public interest and not allowed, and the State Water Board is not allowed to revisit that determination. That project reservoirs should be managed to meet public trust, water quality, and municipal obligations first, and deliveries to contractors second. That reservoir storage requirements and diversion reductions are needed to avoid species extinctions and protect native fish, water quality, and municipal supply. There were requests to establish a higher carryover storage requirement for Shasta earlier in the year, to take actions to limit diversions, including emergency regulations and curtailments. There were requests to reconsider or rescind the TUCP order and approval of the Sacramento River TMP and requests to update and implement the Bay Delta Plan and associated orders to achieve reasonable protection, reasonable protection of fish and wildlife. Next slide, please. The draft order on reconsideration that was released for public review and comment on December 15th responds to the petitions for reconsideration and the major comments received. The draft order denies in part and grants in part petitions for reconsideration to the extent that additional conditions can improve drought management in 2022. Next slide. This slide contains um, the conditions, the draft order conditions that were included in the draft order on reconsideration and I'll go through those now. The first condition requires reclamation to submit a Sacramento River temperature management plan that demonstrates the fishery will be protected from detrimental temperatures, uses the best available hydrologic information and improved modeling, 
and provides for consistency with the interim operations plan as approved by the court in response to litigation on the 2019 biological opinions for the projects, including maximum temperature values for winter red Chinook salmon protection, Shasta end of September storage and agency consultation. A draft temperature management plan would be required by April 1st, 2022 and a final by May 1st, 2022. Condition two of the draft order would require DWR and Reclamation to evaluate and identify minimum delta export thresholds for the purposes of meeting health and safety and wildlife refuge needs that are consistent with any infrastructure and operational safety constraints. A draft report would be due to the State Water Board no later than March 1st, 2022, and a final report would be due no later than 30 days after receiving staff and public comments. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, can you go back? I think I wasn't ready to advance, thanks. Condition three of the draft order would require DWR and Reclamation to identify and implement needed improvements to forecast methods to avoid significant over or underestimates of available water supplies and to provide updates to the board on these efforts along with updates on current hydrologic and operational forecasts for the water year on a monthly basis starting in February, 2022. Monthly hydrologic and operational forecasts would also be required to be submitted in writing and include information on forecasted inflows, reservoir releases, water supply deliveries, reservoir storage levels, and any coordinated operation agreement debts, planned water transfers, forbearance agreement actions, exchanges, and other actions of this nature. Condition four would require DWR and Reclamation to provide a report by March 1st, 2022 accounting for the actual monthly contract deliveries that occurred during the water year 2021. For Feather River and Sacramento River settlement contractors, the report would be required to identify what portion of the delivery was made pursuant to state water project and Central Valley project water rights, and what portion of the water was diverted under the settlement contractor's own rights and claims of right. Identification of settlement contractor supplies that were transferred, exchanged, or part of forbearance agreements and the groups of users that the water was provided to, and the total quantity of water diverted under all rights and claims to these users and the allocation of percentage that it represents. So this concludes our presentation on the order on reconsideration. I will now provide a very short summary of the 2022 TDCP request. I think that's the next slide. Okay. So the 2022 TCQ request was submitted on December 1st, 2021 to address low reservoir storage levels from dry conditions in water years 2020 and 2021 and potential low future precipitation. The TUCP requests modifications from February 1 through April 30, 2022 to reduce Delta outflow requirements to 4,000 CFS from a range of 7,100 CFS to 11,400 CFS or the equivalent salinity levels. Associated with these reductions in outflows, maximum exports would be limited to 1,500 CFS during times that 7,100 CFS could not be met. The TUCP also requests the ability to open the Delta cross channel gates during times when they are required to be closed pursuant to D1641. Last, the TUCP requests a relaxation in the San Joaquin River at Vernalis minimum flows to 710 CFS. The unmodified flow requirement that is applicable under D1641 varies based on time of year, water year type, and delta outflow requirements. In dry and critical years, the range of flows is between 710 CFS and nearly 5,000 CFS. As DWR and Reclamation staff will discuss in more detail following my presentation, since the 2022 TUCP was submitted, precipitation conditions have greatly improved, resulting in uncertainty around the need for the requested TUCP modifications. The January 10, 2022 water supply forecast is expected to help clarify whether a TUCP is needed starting in February or not. Accordingly, a subsequent informational item is planned on the January 18 um, water board meeting on this topic. Next slide. Public, written public comments on both the draft order on reconsideration and the 2022 TUCP must be submitted by 12 noon this Friday, January 7th. Instructions for submitting written comments for either or both issues can be found in the respective notices at the web links shown on this slide. 
Next, next slide. So this slide covers our next steps and creates an opportunity for questions. So following our staff presentation, DWR and Reclamation staff will provide a few presentations. First, Michael Anderson and Dave Rosardo from DWR will provide information on hydrologic conditions and forecasting. Next, Kristen White and Molly White from DWR will give an update on project conditions and the 2022 TUCP. Rosemary Hartman from DWR will close with a presentation summarizing all the bloom and aquatic weed monitoring in the Delta this past summer. Following agency participation, we will hear oral public comment from the draft order on reconsideration and the 2022 TUCP. After the deadline for written comments on January 7th, staff will evaluate ongoing development of this year's hydrologic conditions and both the written comments and oral comments heard today for an action by the executive director on the 2022 TUCP. As mentioned earlier, we are planning another 2022 TUCP update on January 18th as a board information item after the January 10 hydrologic forecast. After an evaluation of public oral and written comments, the board will consider action on the draft order on reconsideration. This is planned to occur at a regularly scheduled board meeting in the near future. And finally, we would like to give advance notice that the board is tentatively planning to hold a public workshop in March on Sacramento River salmon fishery outcomes and performance during the 2021 temperature management season. This will be a retrospective look at the operational management of Shasta Lake, the resulting temperature conditions, ex conditions experienced by the fish, and the resulting performance and survival of salmon populations in the Sacramento River. This concludes the staff presentation, and we can now open it up to board members if they have questions before we move on to DWR and reclamation presentations. Great, thank you, uh, Ms. Forsman and Ms. Riddle for that presentation. I don't have any questions at this point, uh, and I, I see Vice Chair uh, Diadamo has joined us. Welcome, uh, good to see you this morning, and I'll just open it up to any other board members if you have any questions at this point. I'm not seeing any. So I think with that, uh, Ms. Riddle, we can proceed to the DWR presentations. Thank you. Uh, we can turn it over to uh, Mike Anderson. All right. Good morning, board members. Um, hope the presentation comes up here. There we go. Uh, so I will be covering the first part of the talk and we'll talk about some of the uh, rather extraordinary elements uh, that we've been through here recently. I'll hand off to uh, Mr. David Rosardo, head of the hydrology section in the Division of Flood Management at the department. who will talk about our forecast improvements and then I'll close with an outlook of what we might expect over the next three months. Uh, so next slide, please. And yeah, so we covered that, so let's go to the next slide. All right, so let's look at this past water year. And before that, we'll actually start about heading into water year 2021. Uh, if we think back to August of 2019, we experienced record heat. That record heat extended into both September and October. We also had an unusual event in that we had three decaying tropical systems make landfall north of the Golden Gate, uh, which included over 10,000 lightning strikes in a short order, lighting over 700 fires, leading to the largest uh, burned acreage in California's history. Uh, Precip uh, then was late in arriving. And uh, by that point then, as, as we miss out on the fall precip and we head towards winter and the days get shorter, the sun is lower in the southern sky. We get cooler, and then if the snow falls before you have that opportunity to fall rains to try and offset the dryness, in this case, an accentuated dryness from that heat, uh, you have a snowpack setting up on dry soils. And so the amount of snow you see won't materialize entirely into runoff. However, the challenge, we, uh, 
don't have an easy way to articulate uh, a measurement of that, uh, working with our research partners to try and improve on that. Uh, we'll get to more of that in a little bit. Uh, but what happened in 2021 was really fascinating. It's the second driest single year for statewide precipitation. Uh, only water year 1924 was drier. And as mentioned in the earlier presentation, in the two year period, 20 and 21 now exceed 76, 77. So you, you have uh, a level of dryness that rivals the worst that we've seen in our observed record. Uh, in addition to that, in the April, May, and June period, when your snow is melting and beginning to run off, we had our both driest and warmest spring on record, uh, meaning that conditions that were observed were entirely outside the historical distribution of over 120 years. Um, very challenging environment uh, to try and uh, operate in. So let's go into the next slide. All right, on top of that, uh, just an example, as I mentioned there with the record setting fires and fires that continued even this past year, largely impacting the Feather River watershed. And what we see in this and, and the final numbers there um, actually don't include every, in the end, the total acreage that burned in the region. But the key point here is about two thirds of the Feather River watershed has burned in the last three years. What that means is this is now a different watershed than it was five years ago. And you can see the um, monitoring sites that we have in the basin and how many of those were uh, overrun by the fire. Uh, when that happens and assessing the damage to the equipment, you determine and then the ability to replace repair, uh, given the hazardous conditions that are there, uh, you're limiting your ability to have that key information as you move forward. And, uh, We'll talk about that more a little later. So let's go on to the next slide. All right, so uh, kind of looking at this cumulative sense, um, for those keeping track, we're in our third uh, multi-year drought in the last 15 years. Uh, all of them having record setting elements at the time that we were experiencing them, uh, which would indicate that they're becoming more extreme, fits the narrative of a warming world. So we're going to look at that from a standpoint of a cumulative perspective on three indices that uh, span the Sierra Nevada, to kind of give us a sense of how wet the major water producing watersheds into the Central Valley are. Top graphic is the Northern Sierra Eight Station Water Index. And um, what we see is if we transfer the um, values into either above average, below average, and keep track of it as it goes, uh, we see that over the 21st century, we start losing ground. We're having more dry years than those wet years that offset them. And the wet years um, aren't sufficient enough or enough of them in a row to offset those accumulating deficits. So this is an index-based method to kind of uh, reflect on a state becoming more arid, at least over the past 15 years. Um, consistent, as I said, with three multi-year droughts in that time period. And we see that uh, effect continuing both in the San Joaquin and down in the Tulare um, Lake region with those accumulated deficits becoming um, on the order of multiple years worth of precipitation. Uh, now, this is an index-based method. In other words, you're averaging uh, a set of stations to try and represent a wide area. And uh, one of the things we want to move to is a more spatially explicit uh, evaluation of this, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, next slide. All right, but one of the things I want to talk about, about the fact that we've been through this December, and one fantastic month, right? Uh, but it's just that, one fantastic month out of our wet season that still has three to go um, to try and offset what were record setting drought conditions. And one way we can look at that is we can look at these graphics from the California Nevada River Forecast Center. And we see that we are wet enough that we're getting the response when it rains, the rivers are coming up. That's fantastic. That means at least the surface portion of the watershed has restored its moisture to allow runoff to occur. Uh, what we're seeing though is when the rain stops, those river flows dive right back down into very low base flows. And what that gives us an indication is, is that that deeper subsurface that provides that base flow support 
has not been restored. And we wouldn't expect it to. We need, this is why we say we really need um, through the wet season, uh, an extensive prolonged period of wet to kind of restore that element, which then provides the base flows you're more used to seeing, providing uh, for more reliable surface water conditions. Now, what we've seen in the water year so far uh, has not been sustained. It kind of continues a tale we've seen of late of uh, an alternating extremes. In other words, at the end of October, we had an extreme atmospheric river, uh, category five, one of the top five in the 21st century, impacting mostly Northern California, um, record setting rainfall. But then we get to November, very dry, a lot of sunshine, not a lot happening. December comes and we finally get that parade of cold storms we were hoping for. The high pressure system moves off towards the international date line, allows those storms to fall in out of the Gulf of Alaska. Cold storms, fantastic. We get that snowpack that's developing. Now we're here into January and we have a very beautiful sunny day outside. And after a little rain at the end of the week, we are going to be looking at potentially three weeks of dryness. Uh, so we seem to be into this kind of oscillating pattern. And we'll track that, continue it uh, to keep tabs on it. But it keeps in mind that just because you get one really fantastic month, it provides some relief, but not complete relief. And we're really looking for that sustained uh, wet water year to really come through. Um, next slide. All right. So here's where I hand it off to Mr. Dave Rosardo. And then I'll loop back in at the end. Hi, everyone, board members. Thanks for having me today. Um, before I dive into this slide, I just want to tidy up one point that Mike was making, too, is, you know, the one good month is great. Um, and there's a lot of numbers that you see thrown out with our current snowpack. Um, there's the news that, of course, great news, you know, record-breaking snowfall up at the Central Sierra Snow Lab better than the alternative, there's no denying that. But you're always gonna see two numbers with snowpack. The percent of average to date, where we are right now, uh, compared to our normal pace, and then where we are relative to April 1. And April 1 is really the end of the race. It's a marathon, right? Um, and so if you look at today's numbers, you see, oh, we're about a statewide, about 157% or so of average. So we're, we're running the race, that marathon, a little bit faster than normal. That's great news, except for the other number is so important to always keep track of. And that is the fact that as of today, we're 57% of where we need to be by April 1st. If you go back to last April 1, we ended up statewide at 59% of average. So in other words, if Mike's dry outlook holds true, we're looking at a snowpack on April 1 that's very similar two years in a row. So, you know, getting snow here in January, February, March is so crucial. Uh, it's a great start. It's better than the alternative, but there's still a long way to go in that marathon. So, um, you know, it, we've got to weigh the, the positives with the reality there. Um, what I want to do is I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, where we are with our forecasting methodology, um, you know, what kind of currently we do, sort of reset that, and really focus on the variables. And the variables allow you to understand the climate change uh, impacts that Mike talks a lot about. Um, and then where we are now in terms of improvements and, and where we hope to get and some of the challenges in between. So. Uh, looking at our current methodology, this is what we've been using for a long time. It's stati a statistical approach, these equations that we have. And the goal is to forecast an April-July runoff. Um, focusing there on yellow, the independent variables that we use, and it's kind of three categories that you see. The top two are runoff, the middle two are snow, and the last two are precip. And if you look at how runoff and precip are categorized in our current method, they're lumped into seasonal values. Uh, so an October through March or an April through June variable, one variable representing that entire season. Um, and then snow, of course, is, is all based on an April one condition. And where we can, if we have enough elevation band in a number of stations, we break it out into a lower and a higher elevation band. Uh, next slide, please. 
So if you want to take a deeper dive on each of those three variables and where these last 10 years, even the last year itself, has really shown its head, how climate change, it's here, it's now, and it's impacting these variables. And it's impacting then our ability to forecast more accurately. So when you look at rainfall, you're getting a much more increased variability from season to season and even month to month. As Mike just said, we go from an extremely wet December to looking like a pretty dry January. Um, and so when you look at how we lump variables right now into an entire season, these equations in this methodology is decades and decades old. And so those methodologies assume, well, this is how the fall is supposed to be. This is how the winter is supposed to be, uh, but that's not happening anymore. Uh, and so we need to be able to break those lump values out into that sub-seasonal uh, component, a monthly component in this case, to really understand and track these differences uh, than we have before. And so that is a huge challenge. And Mike already talked about the warmer and drier impacts uh, that are just completely drying out you know, the base flow components of our watersheds. And so if we don't get the fall uh, in early winter rainfall or snow, we're setting ourselves up for uh, much less runoff in the spring. Uh, he already articulated really the questions going into this year. One really good storm, but focus on a, a handful of watersheds back in October, and now a pretty good December. Um, but what does that ultimately mean for runoff in the spring? And when you add in the layer of complexities of burned areas and everything else, um, it's, it's really complicated the puzzle piece for us. Uh, snowpack, overall, we've seen this now for, for over a decade, you know, a decreasing Sierra Nevada snowpack. I know there's a lot of news articles out there about will we even have snow, you know, 20, 30 years into the future. But, you know, the here and now is we are losing ground on our snowpack. Um, and then on top of that, again, uh, what are we going to see reaction to the runoff in the Feather River this year when so much of the watershed has been burned over the last couple of years? Um, and we're, we're not experts in that. We are, we are uh, reaching out to a lot of partners in academia who have some uh, work in progress, and they're trying to get grants to help understand that. But you, you're going to have some areas in the Feather River where uh, the soils are going to absorb a lot more of the runoff because of the burn, and you may have an adjoining subbasin where they don't absorb the runoff, and it runs off a lot more directly. Uh, and so fire behavior, uh, you know, one just needs to drive up Highway 50 right now and see the spottiness from the Caldor fire and understand how fire behavior, just from that simple point of view, is very unpredictable and, and very hard to assess how it affects our 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 um, watersheds. Uh, so snowpacking variability, very similar to rainfall. And we saw this last year, um, we were losing this correlation between the lower elevation snowpack and the higher elevation snowpack. Uh, and again, it, it, in simple context, it would be driving up I-80 to Donner Summit. And you get to Blue Canyon and there's so much snow on the ground. And as you go higher and higher in elevation, you expect a certain bit more and more and more of snow. Uh, that would make sense. The higher up you go, the colder it is, the more chances you're gonna have storms that are, that are cold nature and build the snowpack. Uh, when we really peeled back the layers last year and tried to figure out what happened, um, what we realized is way up top in many of our watersheds, the Feather River included, was the snowpack actually up there was not at the same percentage as it was in the lower elevations. We had a lot of snow in the lower elevations, which made us believe there was higher snow up top. Uh, and so your question may be like, well, why didn't you know? Well, way up top in most of our watersheds, we don't have the ability to have direct measurements. Um, they're either too far or too remote, whatever the case may be, where we don't have snow courses and we don't have snow pillows. Um, and so Mike talked about it earlier, we need better spatial understanding of what's going on in these watersheds. Um, and then runoff, again, the warmer and drier climate and the dependency now on these atmospheric, or atmospheric river type events to give us our rain and our snow rather than a whole season full of chipping away at it. Uh, it's, it's really kind of become a feast or famine sort of situation during the winter months. 
Um, and so again, if we go into three straight weeks, as Mike was suggesting of dry period, the snowpack's not gonna necessarily disappear during those three weeks, but what is it doing to it? It's compacting it, it's turning it more into ice. It's, you know, again, maybe in the burn areas, we're losing some of it underneath, but um, as compared to, you know, previous climate where that snowpack was slowly added to throughout the winter time, um, and and kind of help preserve itself. Um, so that is definitely affecting our runoff, lower base flow, which is really adding up to a much more complex picture. Uh, next slide, please. So where do the forecast improvements start? Well, they really start at the, the basic level. Uh, the team has made remarkable progress this year on really the extremely necessary baseline things that needed to change. Uh, changing our historical averages from a 50-year average that went through 2015 to the more recent 30-year average through, uh, through 2020, that, that gives us a better reflection on this more current hydrologic pattern. And they may not sound like a big step, but when you think about the fact that there's over 375 stations that we need to do the updates for uh, uh, and snow and 125 precip stations, it's quite, a, it's quite an effort to go through and do all that. Um, the equations, as I said earlier, they're looking at these seasonal components. And then what they do, if you're sitting on say February 1 to do a forecast, the current equation method says, okay, I have to guess what's gonna happen in February and March and April and May and June and July to estimate that. April, July volume. And those were based on historical patterns that are no longer holding true. So these median increments uh, are really the thorn in our side because climate has changed so much. Uh, so they've updated these median increments. They're, uh, they're still not perfect. Uh, but again, this is 25 watersheds in the Bolton 120 times three to four equations times three to four variables. It was a pretty heroic effort to get through all that in the last several months. Um, and so these are necessarily baseline changes we need to make for any forecast improvement we're going to make. Uh, getting away from the equations, even into better models, which I'll show you here in a second, these changes still had to occur. Um, and so the other, you know, they're, they're improving some automation of some products, uh, full natural flow equations. Uh, there's been a lot of nice uh, conversation with board staff on all these as well uh, to try to get everybody on the same page here. Um, and then improving the, the 90 and 10 forecast. So the 90 is the dry, dry condition and the 10 is the wet, wet condition uh, and trying to narrow that down because that's, that's kind of capturing the uncertainty of the forecast. Uh, next slide, please. So the overall vision, I, I, that first slide there was to talk about, okay, these were the necessary changes regardless of moving to a better forecasting. Um, so moving to better forecast, we, we've had a long-term goal to bring in emerging technologies. Uh, it's been hampered by lack of funding. It's been hampered by lack of staff, uh, but we are still trying to move forward as best we can. Um, and the key things here is not just a physically based model, but also climate informed. Um, and so a, a model, this ability to look ahead a week or two weeks, or even hopefully someday beyond that, and consider that in the forecast, whereas right now we don't have that. Uh, so we tried to break it down into what we could accomplish in the first year and then what would take a little bit longer uh, and focusing on augmenting the data. You know, models are only as good as what you plug into them. Uh, looking for the types of models and partnerships we could have to improve the models. Uh, and again, focusing on these partnerships, especially with some academia, uh, as well as some of our partner agencies. Next slide, please. So this first, uh, first year or so, um, there's quite a list here. The ones in yellow are the ones I have some slides for that we'll show you here in a second. But Mike mentioned um, you know, the, the index-based precip analysis. Well, we can get away from that by using PRISM. Uh, that's a spatially uh, explicit uh, data collection for pre uh, precipitation um, that gets us up to about a month. Uh, you know, so here on January 1, it, it, the current data would be through say December 1st, but if you combine that with some of our more uh, daily precip numbers, we can, we can have a better spatial estimate of what's going on. 
Uh, really key to what we're doing is the Airborne Still Observatory, ASO. So expanding that this year to include the Feather, Truckee, and Carson Rivers. Uh, we're really excited about that. Um, and then uh, again, data augmentation. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of our snow pillows and precip sensors have gone into disrepair over years for lack of funding and, and staff resources. We, we got some money to do that. Um, there was one site that was completely lost in the Feather River watershed, Humbug. Uh, we worked with Orville Field Division to get a temporary site in there while we have more time to rebuild that next summer, but at least we'll get the key data sets out of there. Um, forecast improvements, uh, machine learning, that's like artificial intelligence. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the USGS Basin Characterization Model, I'll talk about that. And again, um, ASO, it's more than just a pretty picture in a LIDAR collection. It really is an integration of that spatial superior data collection with more sophisticated modeling, and in this case, Warp Hydro um, and iSnowball, which couples with ASO. So it's a iSnowball is a model that really lets us understand physically what's happening in the snowpack on a basin wide level. Uh, we have many basins already set up and running on that and uh, pretty excited about that. And then the partner collaborations with CW3 down at Scripps, especially helping us with their experience with machine learning um, and then Mike's efforts over the many years to continue to push for better understanding of atmospheric river forecasting. Next slide. I'm, I'm Mr. Rosardo, I just, I, as, thank you so far for your presentation. And you know, as, as you go forward here, uh, you know, one thing that we're certainly, I think, all feeling is the urgency of the issue and really trying to get our arms wrapped around what can we improve, you know, in the short term. And I know you're looking through this incrementally and knowing that we need to make a number of investments in these different forecasting technologies. Um, I'm really interested as you go forward here to hear about, you know, what it is that we'll have available this year. Uh, what are we incorporating into this year's forecasting? Uh, coming up here in the next couple of months. So if you could sort of weave that in so it's clear for everyone what tools we'll have uh, and then maybe in future years. Appreciate that. Yeah, and, and you'll see that here in these slides coming up for sure. Okay, next. Uh, so this is beyond that. Uh, you know, this is what we're trying to do beyond that. And the main point here is there's much more to do that takes a little bit more time, but you'll see a number of things here with an asterisk and the, and the point there was that these were ideas that were thrown out. There was funding that was sought through the BCP process that um, uh, hasn't fully gone through. Uh, we we're still lack funding in, in the state augmentation and forecast improvement efforts on many of those. So we'll continue to push on those, but they are uh, key to, to, to your point, what are we doing now? But we've got to sustain that. We've got to have the funding and the staffing to sustain that long term. Uh, next, next slide. So these, this gets into what we're doing in the here and now. Um, I mentioned machine learning, also kind of known as artificial intelligence. This, this is necessary to bridge the gap between the old statistical equations and moving into a more physically based model. So what machine learning in its basic form allows us to do is instead of focusing on just those three variables, start to look at other variables this year in test mode and run them through a machine learning process through hundreds of applications at once, uh, equations, methodologies, whatever, and it'll tell us, hey, this is the best, this is the best one forward for this, for this forecast period or whatever. Uh, so it's like having a, a giant army of forecasters working for you uh, considering much more variables uh, that we're looking at. Um, the climate water deficit Mike talked about, and I'll show you a slide on what the basin characterization model is. That's something that we're looking at plugging into this machine learning this year and, and having that available as guidance as they, as they um, produce the bolt in 120. So that's another way of looking at soil moisture and what's going on in, the, in, in this deficit, um, giving us some advice on how much water we might lose to the soils compared to direct runoff. Um, like I mentioned, you know, we really need to move to a climate informed model that's looking out at what's going to happen climate wise. One sort of artificial way we can do that this year is to take the full natural flow 
And uh, instead of a monthly volume, we can look at, say, if on an April 1 forecast, we can look at the daily financial flow trends like leading up to the first and then uh, the first couple of days of the month um, and put that into the forecast so that the, the forecast equation is saying, okay, here's if we had a storm or we had something that's affecting the financial flow, uh, either up or down, closer to that actual forecast period, uh, we can kind of capture that trend uh, into the forecast. Um, good or bad, whether it's high or low, we can incorporate May 1 snow data. Um, and that will bridge that gap between what happened on April 1 and how quickly it was melting or did we add to it, um, which happens a lot in, in more wet years. Uh, and then as I alluded to earlier, a big thing is breaking out these monthly or these seasonal uh, values more into monthly values. So how is the flow responding month to month to month rather than for this entire period of October, March, or how is the precip um, uh, affecting the, the equations on a monthly basis rather than one big giant uh, seasonal value. And again, I think this current year demonstrates that importance because if I'm, if I'm on Feb 1 or if I'm on March 1 and the October, March precip says, hey, you're at 120% of average, but all of that was from one storm in October and one month in, in December, that doesn't really tell the whole story that November was dry and maybe January was dry or February was dry. Um, you know, so that this is, a, to me, a really big improvement of how we can try to disaggregate the data this year and look at it a little bit better. And it's made available through the machine learning process. Um, and then, you know, the short term forecast, looking at those to help with median conditions. So this is the short term climate precip forecast to help with those median um, increments that I referred to earlier. Uh, and then I'll get into the ASO here in a second. Uh, next slide. So here's the Airborne Snow Observatory slide. Um, what you see on the left is a map of uh, all the, in orange, all the watersheds that are forecast in the Bolton 120, uh, going from the high up the Shasta drainage and the Trinity, all the way down to the Kern River. And then on the Eastern Sierra, we have the Truckee, Carsons and Walker Rivers that we produce forecasts for. Um, in, uh, you see down in the central and Southern Sierra Nevada, we, we have existing ASO data collection uh, program in the Tuolumne, Merced, San Joaquin, Kings, and Coahuila. And really excited about adding the Feather, the Truckee, and the Carson this year. Um, the Truckee and the Carson come because of federal funding, uh, an interest in the program. And we also have a lot of federal funding coming in for the San Joaquin that's tied to their river restoration program. Uh, so we're very excited to have their funding and their partnership on that and seeing the value in this. Um, and then the state water project contributions to the Feather River this year. So with the number of burned areas in the Feather River, we were able to get in in October and refly the baseline condition. So we make sure we understand what the watershed currently looks like before there was snow on it uh, so that the models moving forward reflect the current conditions of the watershed physically. Um, as I said, ASO, so if you're not familiar with it, we're flying over the watersheds. We're getting an entire spatial coverage of the entire watershed of exactly how much snow is on the ground. Uh, in the higher Sierra down south, we've had accuracies as, as high as 97% of, of being able to account for the snowpack. So this is a vast improvement. Uh, the feather is not so much of a snowmelt driven watershed as it is a precip driven watershed, but any accounting of that snowpack is very important, uh, regardless of the burn areas. And, and especially, as I alluded to earlier, having these big blind spots of not really knowing what the snowpack is, we eliminate that uh, to some degree with ASL. And then as I alluded to earlier, it gets coupled to models that can take that data in. And you see an example from the ice snowball model here in the lower right where this was the Kings River from last year, and it's showing you very definitively where the snowpack is on the map, and then across elevation bands and sub-drainage areas, how that snowpack looks in terms of how much water it, it could potentially yield. And so really dive in, we will have 
Uh, we've had these tools available in the Tuolumne through the CAWEA. The, this year, one of the leap forward, so going to the next slide, uh, we have a pilot program this next year in the Feather River and in the San Joaquin to couple this with the Wharf Hydro uh, hydrologic forecasting model. Uh, and again, I refer back to those variables, and that's why I spent so much time under explaining those. Here's a slide that shows you with Wharf Hydro, you have so many more variables that are being modeled and accounted for uh, evaporation, evapotranspiration, soil moisture. These are all modeled values, but it's something we don't currently have. Um, so we're excited about this. You know, we're running it as a pilot program. We're running it in parallel. We've never run this model before. Uh, so our, our, our partners are helping us run this and, and the, the people that built this model at NCAR are the ones that are gonna be supporting this and, and helping us understand it. But it is in parallel and it, it takes a lot to do something you've never seen before and then put a lot of faith in that into your forecasting. So is, this is why it's a pilot program that we, we hope to contain over the next couple of years uh, as a proof of concept. Um, next slide. I've talked about the uh, USGS Basin Characterization Model a little bit. This, this to me is one of the best snapshots of it. And it's showing you from left to right, year to year, how the soil conditions have become more critically dry through 2021. And I chose these three years because 2019 was a wet year. Uh, and yet you see that even though it was a very wet year and just two years prior to that, was 2017, which was in some ways a record setting wet year in terms of precipitation, uh, you still had almost all the state in a medium, you know, critical condition for soil moisture and quite a bit, especially the bulk of the central and southern Sierra Nevada and along the coastlines uh, in a high critical condition in terms of soil moisture uh, deficit. And then as Mike alluded to, we then followed through on two of the hottest and warmest, driest years on record. Uh, and you see how quickly it went in those two year period. Um, so this is a modeled result. Um, that's important to understand that we're taking a model result and we're gonna plug it into another model. So there is some uncertainty with what that does. Um, actual soil moisture measurements in the ground in the Sierra Nevada especially are hard to come by. Uh, and this is important to understand that we're working through this, but there's your permits with the, the US Forest Service and the National Park Service. You have to make sure you're able to dig in the right areas and, and it, it takes a very long time to get that. So that's part of our plan in upgrading our data collection. Uh, it's been actually a plan for quite some time uh, to get actual soil moisture measurements. But in the meantime, this can help us out quite a bit. Uh, next slide. And then, so looking at this climate water deficit, um, this is really similar to what Mike showed earlier in terms of the precip index of showing how things have just gotten drier and drier. And we're, you know, a water year or two or three years behind in terms of how much rainfall in the Northern, Central and Southern Sierra. This is what the BCM model is showing us. And so for any of these scales, it's a little odd to wrap your head around it, but as the bars go higher and higher, uh, on the graphs, that means you're getting drier and drier because it's a deficit. Uh, and so what all these are showing you is uh, as we got to the worst of the last drought in 2015, we flipped way over to a, a, a climate water deficit in, in throughout the Sierra Nevada. Um, we've got a little bit of relief um, in the central Sierra around the wetter years of 2019, uh, but it's, it's a growing deficit in, in all cases. So the model is, is proving what we can see from the precip records as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, so again, the summary on this, it's a calculated monthly volume. How will we use it? Um, we can plug some of these values into the machine learning this year. We can uh, give us an idea. It gives us some idea of what's going on with the soil moisture. Uh, more than we've ever had before, uh, you know, and it is a monthly volume, so it is limited, or a monthly value, so it is limited, but uh, we'll, we'll learn it on the fly. We are in contact with the GS who runs this, so they're consulting with us and helping us understand how to interpret it 
and how possibly to apply it to the forecast this coming year. Um, so it, it's a great tool for us to learn how to use and, and consider using in the future. And next slide. I think we're back to Mike on this. All right, thank you, Dave. Um, so a few other points on the basin characterization model. One, just uh, the level of investment. That partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey started with the 2007 to 2009 drought. Here we are a decade later. We are now beginning to actually realize the benefit of that development effort. Uh, so when we talk about um, the time to develop some of these longer term goals, a lot of it is resource dependent. That entire effort was done uh, through uh, the opportunity, opportunistic funding, uh, kind of bits and pieces along the way. It was not a dedicated program to improve it. Uh, but we are finally being able to see benefit from it, which is fantastic. So let's take a look. Um, right now, uh, we're looking at water year 2022 and by the end of December, right around 150% of average uh, precipitation statewide. Again, really focused into um, a really strong December and the extreme event in October. One thing to note about the extreme event in October was that that was primarily a Northern California event. Uh, Southern California really didn't see the benefit of that. However, this past week, Southern California had its own extreme event in the LA Basin uh, seeing a significant portion of their annual precip fall all at once. Uh, the challenge with those events is not all of that water gets to hang around to be used later. Uh, a lot of it runs off right away. Uh, can provide some initial benefit for that, but it's somewhat ephemeral in that benefit. Uh, really illustrating the range of how the watersheds are, are, are kind of uh, responding to this. Uh, we have uh, only 30 7% of our full natural flow in the Trinity, 185% uh, in the Consumnus. Now there you have kind of two different environments. One, you have um, a mountainous area that probably is getting more snow. So you're not seeing that runoff right away. Consumnus, a lower elevation watershed where it's rainfall um, moving to runoff. And also a thing to consider is the very different geological settings that those are in. Uh, and we've had the record setting precipitation in some locations. And it's really important to note that those are point values, not really representative uh, broadly of the state. Uh, there's a, a graphic from the new California Water Watch showing the statewide kind of temperature. Uh, the red line there is your um, maximum uh, for each day. The light blue line there is the minimum temperature recorded for that day, kind of the statewide average. The green line is average conditions and the purple line is what we're experiencing. Uh, you can see there we uh, dipped in October uh, as we had those rainfall events, but November right up there against the extremes in the warm again. Uh, December getting closer back to average conditions. Um, so really a nice way to kind of see now, rather than as Dave said, kind of taking these uh, lump seasonal indicators getting a higher temporal fidelity to the information being provided, which is really key. Let's go to the next slide, um, which unfortunately is the outlook for January, February, and March. Hopefully it'll pop up on my screen here. All right, so I have two ways of looking at it. We have a dynamic models from uh, the National Weather Service's Climate Prediction Center. They run a group of models called the National Multimodel Ensemble, or NMME. It's a collection of models that run a forecast out eight months. Uh, their climate models uh, that really look to see, are you leaning wet, leaning dry uh, over that time period? In this case, we're looking at a model initiated in December, and this is the three-month outlook for January, February, March. And where we see red on the graphic is where the model's predicting dry conditions, where we see the greens and blues are the wet conditions. And so what we're seeing is that uh, a lot of moisture down there by Hawaii uh, all that great tropical moisture not being able to get into the Eastern Pacific and to California, largely because of a high pressure system setting up in there. And we're seeing that start to develop now. Now, that's a computer model version. And again, um, 
predicting out that far, you lose skill as you get further out. So what we couple that with is the expert assessment, where you get a group of experts that look at the computer models, look at the climate index data, um, and really discuss what they might expect for January through March. And these are the seasonal outlooks produced by the, the climate uh, prediction center. And what they're showing here, and you can see how what the computer model suggests is reflected in their assessment of where they really feel comfortable saying we see, expect uh, above average precipitation, uh, kind of the Great Lakes Midwest area and in the Pacific Northwest, uh, but really the Southern tier states uh, really seeing drier than average conditions. Now the areas that are white are where they're unwilling to move off of uh, a uniform distribution, presuming anything can happen. And then they modify that uniform distribution based on the information that they're pulling in. And they're suggesting South of Santa Barbara really do expect to be dry. Um, as we go north of Santa Barbara, uh, there's a mixed signal and it's how strong is that high pressure system going to be? How long is it going to last? And how does it interact with these opportunities when you do get a wet storm in? If that's a really wet storm and an extreme, um, how is that reflective relative to average precipitation? So again, with these expert assessments, you look at the metrics that they're trying to predict on. Um, and we need a little more detail and fidelity in, in the work that we're doing. But what we're seeing here are signs that um, great start, but may not be sustained. And you might ask yourself, well, has that happened before? And we could go back to water year 2013. Uh, water year 2013 had a November and a December. Each of those months were 200% of average. Uh, by New Year's, in 2012, we were wetter than the wettest year on record back then, which was 1983. Um, at that point, we saw something we had never seen before, which was we went through 14 months that were um, drier than the driest water year on record, but split over two water years. Um, but the challenge is there from starting really wet to going drier than you've ever seen led to a lot of water management challenges in 2013. Uh, and that was starting with a year before that wasn't really dry. We're in a situation where we're starting in record setting drought conditions. We had a great month, but we might go dry again. And really trying to figure out that scenario is a huge challenge. Um, and I think with the next slide, we get to questions. Yes. And Dave and I are happy to answer any questions on this aspect of the presentations. Okay, well, thank you for that. I, um, you know, I, I know there's a lot of information forthcoming here, uh, and the, you know, there's a, a water supply forecast coming out. I think in, the, in about five days, uh, our order that we're talking about today uh, contemplates asking for monthly forecasts from you, um, you know, starting in February and going forward through the rem remainder of the water year. And it's only really, you know, for me, emphasized by all the uncertainty here that's been cast and the work still remaining uh, to, to really improve the tools that we have. So right. I'll, I'll be very interested to see um, kind of a documentation of, you know, what tools you've been able to incorporate into the forecast that we start to see roll out here in the next few days and the coming months. Because I, I remember last year, you know, it was, it was March, I think things were not looking too horrible, um, but you know the wheels fell off the cart pretty shortly thereafter. And that's really what we're trying to avoid. Uh, right. So I'm, I'm really hopeful, I'm, I'm glad you're doing a lot of work here in a lot of different areas and that's really encouraging. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll have to see then and learn, I guess, as, as we go forward, how those tools are really informing uh, the real world and, and what we're seeing in terms of runoff in the watersheds, but thank you for that presentation. Were there any other questions from board members? All right. Uh, sorry, I was okay. a little slow of getting there. Um, I, I have a question about the high pressure systems. And of course we saw that, um, you know, quite a bit also in the last drought. And so just 
um, looking for your comment on the relationship between those high pressure systems and uh, accelerated climate change, if there's any relationship uh, between the two. Okay, yeah. So let's start with uh, the high pressure systems themselves. They're a feature of um, uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation Phenomena. We're in a La Nina condition, which tends to put a high pressure somewhere in the Pacific during the winter months. And that's really key. Now, some of the challenges we're seeing is the strength of it, how long it stays in a given place. Uh, and those are elements that can be impacted by a warming world. Uh, the challenge is right now, we're still trying to diagnose recent events to determine the influence of warming. Uh, you hear them referred to as attribution studies. Um, and so the expectation though is as there's more energy for the atmosphere to work with in a warming world, these systems can become stronger, which means they're more likely to stay stationary. And in our case, if it's stationary in the Eastern Pacific, it's blocking our precipitation in a very narrow window, if you think about it, we have 90 days to try and accumulate on average half our annual precipitation. And if these events tend to be stronger, last longer, they can become more disruptive. Um, we'll definitely stay in touch with uh, the folks at the Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research with NOAA that look at those attribution studies to try and better understand them and hopefully maybe get better at forecasting them so we can anticipate um, these conditions a little better than we have in the past. Thank you. All right. I think if there aren't any other questions, we can move on to the next presentation, which I believe is uh, Kristen White with Bureau of Reclamation and Molly White with DWR. Thank you, Kristen. There you are, hello. Hey, good morning, board members. Uh, thank you very much for having us here. Uh, my name is Kristen White. I'm the operations manager for the Central Valley Operations Office with the Bureau of Reclamation. And I'm here presenting with uh, Molly White. Molly, do you wanna introduce yourself? Hi, everybody, will do. Um, mom, oh, there we go, there's my camera. Um, good morning, everyone. Happy New Year, board members. Um, Happy to be here, I'm Molly White, um, Operations Manager for the State Water Project. Great, thank you. Uh, next slide. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about kind of what led up to the TUCP and where we're at now. Uh, so going over a water year summary, which you heard some uh, in the last presentation. So we'll go over that pretty quickly. Um, what concerns we had going in with early planning, um, some of which still exist and uh, uh, some of the early drought actions. And then a recap of, of how we've been seeing things on the operation side, uh, current conditions, and then our status and next steps. Next slide. Great, so where we ended was really, really low. <laughs> really low reservoir storages. Uh, as you heard, Shasta saw the lowest inflow ever recorded on record uh, that resulted in it being not quite its lowest, it was lower in 77, but, um, but extremely low at uh, just under 1.1 million acre feet. Um, Folsom, also, Folsom also pretty low, uh, just over 200,000 uh, 200, acre feet. Uh, Oroville is at its lower lowest uh, reservoir storage ever at 787. And New Maloney is also fairly low at, uh, at uh, uh, just over 800,000 acre feet or 35% of its capacity. So going in uh, to water year 2022, we definitely had large holes uh, that need to be filled in all of our reservoirs. Um, on top of that, we had those extremely dry soils. So any rain that did come off, we didn't, uh, or any rain that did occur, we didn't expect a uh, significant runoff. And then we had those seasonal forecasts showing below average precipitation for Southern California. So um, just really not a great start. Uh, next slide. So that's what this uh, looks like. You can see the graph. Uh, this was uh, on the, hopefully, hopefully everybody's left and right is the same as mine on the left here, the reservoir charts. Um, this is September 30th. You can see how low we are across uh, pretty much the entire state. Soil moisture um, to, the, to the upper right, uh, where most of the state is in the uh, driest category possible of, uh, of uh, 
percentile soil moisture. And then that outlook uh, that's down in the in the bottom right showing that um, Southern California in the drier um, um, drier area for Southern California. Next slide. All right, so uh, so we started looking at uh, you know in the in the August September time frame, what could water year 2022 look like if the drought continues? And um, Director Namath and Director Conant uh, uh, presented a little bit on this in the Fed, at the September board meeting. Um, but we looked at some scenarios of, well, what if we had minimal precipitation through December, as we've seen in, uh, in numerous drought years? Uh, the forecasts would uh, would all be adjusted down uh, because of dry antecedent conditions, both soil moisture and any uh, any effects of the previous water year type in the water year calculations. And what that showed us was uh, th that it was very possible that water year 2022 could end worse than water year 2021, um, which had a total storage of 2.1 between uh, Folsom, Oroville, and Shasta. So, uh, so that was very, um, very concerning, uh, given that where we ended was uh, uh, very, very low. Um, and then worse yet, that the uh, storage at the end of year uh, water, at the end of year water year 2022 was uh, unlikely to be higher than the start of 2021, meaning that 2023 could continue uh, in, in a similar pattern to be worse than 2021. So uh, so very, very concerning um, possibilities, which led us into uh, some pretty significant planning and looking at our top concerns. If we can go to the next slide. So our top concerns going into this year, uh, of course, Shasta as our uh, largest reservoir in the system had extremely low storage. That means limited cold water pool. That means limited storage for meeting uh, system-wide demands and limited carryover going into 2023. Um, Folsom, very similar with the added concern of uh, a low storage there can also uh, uh, impact the ability to meet public health and safety for the people who rely on water out of Folsom. So it's definitely a concern. Um, New Maloney's that has a uh, very low um, uh, carryover, uh, sorry, a, a very low uh, refill rate. And so the carryover uh, going into 2022 was likely to uh, continue to drop, or the storage was likely to continue to drop if we had dry conditions persist, meaning that we would have extremely low uh, reservoir storage going into 2023. Uh, similar at Oroville, low carryover storage going uh, going into the year for meeting demands and for carryover into 2023, and then uh, and then finally Delta operations. Uh, if dry continue, if the uh, dry conditions continued, we'd expect uh, significant storage releases um, for ma managing salinity intrusion. This can even happen in the winter. It can even happen this winter, even though we've seen some. Uh, what conditions? So, um, so looking at that, and uh, and then coupled with that, we'd expect very low exports, uh, which uh, has two two side effects. One, it's of course the limits our our uh, south of Delta storage for meeting those demands, but it also limits our operational flexibility. Where if we have an unexpected event, such as a um, salinity or or a wind driven type salinity event, um, then our first response would typically be to lower exports. But if they're already extremely low, then that doesn't give us that option. So it limits that flexibility. Next slide. So all these concerns led us to really hone in on how we can conserve upstream storage, which was the primary driver for submitting the TUCP. So we submitted this TUCP uh, on December 1st at the board's request to allow 60 days for public process prior to the TUCP needing to be um, uh, uh, relied upon, which would be February 1, uh, according to the petition that we uh, submitted. Um, we really focused on conserving upstream storage in four main areas. Erin uh, went over this in her presentation, so I'll just briefly touch on it. The reduced outflow to reduce storage releases, um, export restrictions so that we allow for higher outflows when unstored waters in the system, delta cross-channel gate openings to decrease storage releases for salinity, and then reduced for analysis flows to decrease storage releases uh, from new Maloney's. Um, in addition to that, we also, uh, DWR worked on delaying the removal of the West Falls River drought barrier to provide us some additional flexibility and being able to um, uh, use that as a tool should we need it in 2022. Next slide. All right, and now I'm going to hand it to Molly to talk about some of the more positive, <laughs> more, more positive improvements um, uh, and where we're at and where we're going. And hi, everyone. Um, 
there's been a lot of discussion about the October through December um, 2021 hydrology. Just recapping at a high level, um, certainly we've started out the water year with the best start, I would say, coming off the previous two years um, that we could ask for. But again, we're proceeding with caution and um, we are still and very much understand that we are still early in the season. But Again, at a highlight, we did see well above average precip in October and December. We did have that month of November in between, which was dry. Um, soil hydration did improve significantly between the three months. Um, you know, at this point, at, at least looking at near normal runoff efficiency, but at this point, we again, Mike and Dave certainly went over all the uncertainties with the soil moisture and associated um, runoff, but definitely in a better position than we were three months ago. And then again, that snowpack, um, about 50 to 60% of average, um, April 1st average, which is typically when we see the um, seasonal peak. And then lastly, um, a lot of the storms that we did see were focused in the F American River um, watershed as well as the Feather River watershed. So as such, we, we received the snowpack as we talked about, but also did see significant um, storage improvement in both of those upstream storage reservoirs. Upstream reservoirs. Uh, next slide, please. Again, so let, we'll fast forward here. This is a graphic and um, uh, Three months later, Kristen provided this uh, snapshot again. If you look at the reservoirs here, major project reservoirs are still below average with, with the exception of Folsom Lake, but we'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. Up in the upper right, uh, looking at the January 2022 soil moisture graphic, it's there's no more red in California at this point, so that's a good sign. Um, so we're looking at in the upper 20 to 30 percent of the wetter periods at this point at this time of the year. And then, however, again, I you know reiterating the uncertainty that Mike and Dave certainly talked about in their presentation um, that things could change if the dry conditions do persist. And then, lastly, that climate outlook. Um, again, we're looking at equal chances that. Mike went over for below or above normal precip. Next slide. So this is just a graphic of the state of California highlighting where a bulk of the precipitation that has, occur has occurred. Um, looking at again, the feather and the American River basins shown there in purple and that turquoise color where we've seen well above um, normal and extreme above normal precipitation to date. And um, again, up north in the Shaster watershed, not as great as a big, not as um, a good story as Folsom and Oroville with about average and a little bit below average precip falling in that watershed. Next slide. So here's the, um, you all are familiar with this graphic, the eight station index precipitation graphic. Today we're standing at about 31 inches of precip. That is 160% of average. Couple key highlights there is that at 31 inches, we've surpassed the water year 2021 precip in total. We're actually about seven inches ahead of the total precip that we saw last water year. And then we're about just shy of an inch of exceeding the precip that we saw in water year 2020. But one thing to highlight, and again, and Mike touched on this, the if you look at that 31 inches there in royal blue where we're stand, we're in the company of a couple very, two water years that were extreme, extremely different. In the pink, you have 2017, which is the wettest water year on record. And in actual, we got about another 60 inches of precip through the remainder of the water year in 2017. And then in red is 2013, which again, Mike talked about, which was another historic year where we saw 
many, many months of record low precip, what, 13, 14 months um, of the driest stretch on record. So we're in this point of looking at the bounds of that envelope um, and as a climate suggests equal chances, but this kind of gives us a little bit of an insight of where we may fall with precipitation, but it's still uncertain at this juncture. Next slide, please. Again, same story down in the San Joaquin Basin, um, just over 20 inches at 153% of average. And again, tracking similar, similarly with the 2013 and 2017 year. Next slide. And Tulare Basin uh, sits at 13 inches to date at 140% of average and tracking with the wettest year on record, but is um, tapered off there over the past um, few weeks. And with that, I'll hand, next slide, and then I'll hand it over to Kristen to talk about some of the conditions of their key uh, managed reservoirs. Thanks, Molly. So, uh, so as Molly mentioned, we have seen some improvement in the reservoirs, definitely not equally across the board. Uh, as Molly mentioned, the these nice storms that we saw in uh, in December certainly didn't make it to the Shasta watershed the same way they made it to uh, the American River and Feather River basins. Um, we did see some improvement in Shasta, which is great. Uh, we're now at about a little over 1.3 million acre feet, um, but you can see we're still well below the storage that we had in 2014 and 2015 at this time. Um, so certainly need to see some big improvement there, um, but, uh, but at least it's moving in the right direction. Um, next slide. Folsom, um, uh, there's no there's no winners in, in precipitation, but but if there was a winner, it would be Folsom. <laughs> um, it's the one partly because it's such a small reservoir uh, on, on a very large watershed and also uh, uh, partly just because of the how these storms have come in. We've seen significant improvement in the Folsom storage such that uh, we actually started getting into our flood control space. Um, we started increasing releases. Um, I want to say about a week ago, maybe a little bit more than a week ago now, um, to start getting out of that flood control space uh, and, and getting um, uh, um, ha having having room to be able to handle any um, upcoming storm events. So, um, so that's why you see that little dip down. Um, that's that's intentional. That's not because of dry conditions. That's us uh, trying to get back into our uh, our normal operating range. Um, so you can see this is well above average for this time of year and, uh, and above uh, where we've been in previous um, dry years. Next slide. So this is New Maloney's. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out on this, when we get into dry years uh, in the San Joaquin Basin or, or specifically in the Stanislaus watershed, we often see our peak storage at New Maloney's happen on October 1st. And so the storage just pretty much flat lines from October all the way until uh, the March, April time period where we start having some spring pulse flow releases. Um, so you can see that is a, a pattern that we saw in 2014 and 2015 uh, and in 2021, even though we started with decent storage in 2021, you see it's kind of a, it's pretty flat across there, maybe some small changes. Um, this year, the storms that hit, although we say they focus on the American River and, uh, and, and Feather River watersheds, they did hit the, the Stanislaus Basin quite a bit. Um, and we've got a decent snowpack up there now. I think it's somewhere in the order of 140 to 150% of average for this date. Um, and we have seen increase in inflows. Not huge, nothing like what we've seen, what we've seen at Folsom, but they are increasing, um, or they, they have been above, um, above average. And so you can see our storage is starting to go up, which is uh, a departure from kind of the uh, other drought year. So that's good news, um, uh, although it hasn't gone up. Uh, to even get us near average, but um, but we'll see uh, um, what the what the rest of the winter holds and whether or not we can get there. Next slide, and I'll turn it back over to Molly to talk about Oroville. All right, so um, it, we've mentioned this before, and it, it's on the last day of water year 2021. Like Oroville did hit our historic low point in storage at just under 800,000 acre feet at 787,000 acre feet. Um, 
because of the fall storms that we did see, we have gained 600,000 acre feet into the lake, which is fantastic. Um, at the storage, we're at 1.38 million acre feet. We're still below average for this time of year, about 75% of average and 40% of capacity. Um, but there's other, there is good news. We're about 150,000 higher right now than we were a year ago today. And um, shy about 100,000 acre feet away from just surpassing the max storage that we did see in last um, water year. So definitely on a good trajectory with um, inflows and just realizing some of the storm events that we did see um, in October and December. Next slide. We've talked about snowpack here. This is um, as of yesterday. Um, about for statewide, about 150% of average, the across the Sierra spine ranging from 100, about 150, 158% um, of average. Um, we're certainly sitting in a much better place now than we were a year ago with snowpack and that snowpack falling on wetter soils. Um, so that's a, a, a good thing as we start off this um, as we are a third away into the water year, some of the significant months of the water year. Next slide. Current conditions, we, we've really walked through a lot of these. I, I think the overall take home message, you know, outside of Folsom, so Folsom does have increased releases right now to manage for flood control, but with Oroville, Shasta and New Malonis, we have seen storage gains throughout those reservoirs. and certainly um, are at minimum releases in all of those reservoirs to um, conserve storage. And we've talked about the snowpack. Next slide, please. So when Kristen and I were here back last month, um, we our winter operations really haven't changed again, except for Folsom, which um, does have elevated releases for flood control. So right now, again, storage conservation in the main, in our major managed um, reservoirs, uh, we're modifying Delta exports as needed to meet um, requirements and fisheries protections. And then any available water that we are able to export right now is being um, put mostly in to build San Luis storage. Uh, next slide. So the TUCP status. So, so Kristen noted and set up, you know, we did submit the TUCP back on December 1st. It was an early drought action for water year 2022. If it was um, the dry conditions would persist. Um, as we've mentioned, the water years certainly started out better. I mean, the best that we could ask for at this point, um, but understand we're early in the season. Um, but right now, early indications are that a TUCP for February is unlikely, um, but we are definitely proceeding with caution and um, we'll be confirming this with the Division of Flood Management. Um, there'll be, our DWR's Division of Flood Management will be issuing the January forecast on January 10th. So that forecast in itself will include all the December precipitation and so forth. And um, the projects together will be running the numbers and just confirming that a TUCP is not needed for February. And we will be reporting back to the board at the next board meeting on January 18th. Next slide. So next steps, um, not only are we gonna be reevaluating with the January forecast as conditions change and new forecasts are issued, we'll certainly be continuing to reassess the whether a TUCP is needed um, in the February through April time period. Um, as Dave Rizzardo lined out, there are forecast improvements that'll be rolling into the upcoming forecast. And we certainly look forward to see how those are going to shape our operations uh, modeling forecasts. And um, again, we'll be back at the January 18th board meeting to, brought, to provide an update and um, 
thereafter as needed. Uh, we'll be continuing coordination with board staff as well as, like I said, we'll be at the next future board meetings. And then as far as the West Falls River drought barrier, we are notching um, this month and we'll be backfilling in spring if it is needed. But we're not stopping on preparing for um, future if it does dry out. We're not halting any of our planning should 2022 turn out dry. Um, we're continuing preparing and coordinating drought actions, um, again, should the conditions um, dry out. So with that being said, uh, thank you. That is the end of our presentation. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I have a question um, and I was trying to go back in the slides, but um, for the Sacramento, um, and I guess that's mostly Shasta, um, Kristen, you mentioned that one of the reasons um, at the end of last year that you were, you know, planning was looking at um, a TUCP was that, and, and various planning that you outlined was that um, storage going into this um, year was lower than going into 2021. And I'm wondering, at least in, Shasta, um, even if, it, it, is it reasonable to think that we would get to even where we were um, last year with storage and temperature capabilities? Um, I mean, last year and the other drought years, we, we didn't meet temperature requirements um, and had really extreme mortality. So are we going on the the temperature front on Shasta and the storage levels, from what I could tell, it looked like we still weren't even close to where we were going into April of last year, but, um, or even the other drought years. Um, do we think that even with, you know, a wet next few months, which fingers crossed, <laughs> um, that we will be going into that? Or um, can you just tell me more about how you're looking at that issue of, um, comparative storage capabilities. So we're not in the same place on storage. You know, we need to build up storage so that we're not in the same place um, if possible at um, last year or this uh, or the last drought. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's, uh, it's, uh, I wish I could give you some certainty. Um, unfortunately, my crystal ball is on hold. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, caught up in all the delivery delays. <laughs> so I can't, I can't know exactly, but I can give you some insight on how we've been looking at it. Um, so uh, we do have very low storage there. Uh, uh, there is some snowpack, which is a difference than what we had last year. Last year, there was no snowpack, which is why the forecasts of runoff are much higher than they were last year. Um, this January forecast will be very telling of, uh, of how that snowpack might come down and, and what that could mean for storage. Um, right now, some of the, uh, the CNRFC forecasts are showing that we might expect um, uh, close to or a little bit below average inflow, um, which is significantly higher than what we saw last year. So that could be an improvement. But as you heard from the previous presentations, there, there's quite a bit of unknown um, as to how, hard, how high that can get. At this point, what we can do, what, what's within our control is to limit releases. And so we're at minimum releases at Keswick right now. Um, uh, and that's where we'll will stay so we can build storage um, throughout this winter, um, ho hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so that that is that is the plan, um, and then uh, and then really really hoping that we get some good inflow. Um, I will say that temperature management is a function of cold water and how we operate the temperature management device uh, to to be able to use that cold water throughout the year. And although we think about cold water as being related to total storage, which there is some correlation there, it's not a, a direct or a tight correlation. Um, and so we've seen some anomalies in the past, such as 2013. Um, had fairly low storage, but it had a very large cold water pool volume. And then 2016 had decent storage, but it had a very 
very small cold water pool volume. So that's one thing that we'll be watching is to see how that cold water sets out. And there's a lot of different factors that go into that. Um, unfortunately, that's something we won't know until the reservoir begins to stratify, which will start happening sometime mid-April time period. Um, it usually finishes stratifying sometime in May. Um, so that's when we'll have a better understanding right around that mid-May period. We'll have a better understanding of how much cold water that we're actually going to have, which that that will tell us what the um, the temperature goals uh, would be able to we'd be able to reach for the year. Right, and it, that goes to this challenge of um, you know temperature management plan um, timing in terms of when you have that information and when you need to be making those. Um, operation decisions and coming to us, um, submitting something if you think that's not going to be possible. I know that's that's the challenge. Um, and I think um, one that we've, you know, asked to try to address this year um, or asked to be addressed this year in terms of submission by April, I believe, um, it's that, um, well, I guess, can we go to slide 14? Because I think that's what I just want to understand better. It's the Shasta storage slide, I think it's 14. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I just, you know, want to understand better. So the blue, there's two blue lines, at least in the way I can see it. And one is current, right? That's the darkest blue line um, at the bottom. <laughs> and then the, the other blue line is total, um, no, is 2014 through 15, is that right? It's That would be water year 2015, which starts October yeah, 1st, yeah. 2014, right. Okay, so I guess what I'm trying to figure out is if there, you mentioned that it may be, you know, hopefully with snowpack, there's a more average um, refill. And so if there was a more average refill, would we, expect that it would be possible to get up to those levels that we had um, going into, you know, going into April, May. Um, uh, like we, you know, is it comparable to what we had in the last drought yeah. to last year? I, I know you can't know the answer to this, but just an approximation, do we think that if, is it reasonable to think if we have a average runoff um, that we could get to similar storage levels that we were that we were at last year um, or or the other drought years on there. Yeah, it's it's really difficult to know. Um, uh, part, part of the problem with comparing to 2015 is that we had a nice uh, storm in December of 2015, and then we had another one in February, but they were warm, so they didn't really create any snowpack. So you saw that instant response and in inflow, um, which is why you can see it directly where those storms were in this chart. Um, but we have had several storms in the Shasta watershed, not nearly as much in some of the other watersheds. But we have we have had some precip up there. It's just all been cold, so um, so it's difficult right. to know how that's going to come off. Which is um, part of what uh, Mike and, and Dave talked about in their presentation is they're trying to improve the forecast of how that's going to come off and and what we might expect to see. So that's something we'll certainly be looking at in the January forecast. Um, but I would say at this point. Um, it's, I know that this graph is difficult to see, but we are doing much better than 2015. <laughs> but storage yeah. wise, storage wise, we're much lower, but, um, but uh, precip and snowpack wise, we're doing much better. So I, 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 that's a little bit confusing. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, I guess maybe this just goes to kind of a basic question, which is um, obviously you're gonna be coming back to us in a couple of weeks, <laughs> which is pretty soon. Um, can you give us some sense of, um, you know, the major factors that you would be looking at um, or kind of indicators that you might be looking at for whether um, you think you would need to um, continue with TUCP and, um, you know, is there kind of a threshold or a set of indicators that you're 
really watching. Obviously, it's going to, you know, you're going to take every factor into account and it's not that simple, but are there key, key indicators that you're um, going to be focused on just in the next two weeks? Yeah, and I think we'll certainly go over that on the 18th. Um, as, a, as a big picture answer, what we're looking for is, is there a benefit of the TUCP? Um, and if there's enough unstored water forecasted to be in the system to meet Delta requirements, then that means we can't back up any water into, into any of the reservoirs, which means there's not an upstream storage benefit. Um, so that's really what we're looking at, uh, is seeing whether or not um, how that plays out and, and what the runoff forecast says. Um, I mean, right now, all of our reservoirs, except Folsom, which we're trying to, in the opposite, trying to get rid of water there right now, <laughs> but um, maybe not for too long, but, uh, but all the other reservoirs besides Folsom, we're at minimum releases. So we're storing as much as we can, and storage, um, while we're at minimums, is just a function of inflow. It's just how much can come into the reservoir. So, um, so, th so that's why these forecasts and processing these forecasts will be very important. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? All right, I, I had a, a question as well, and I was trying to get to the same sort of you know, thresholds and decision point question that you had, Board Member Firestone. And you know, one of the, the questions I had actually at our, our last discussion last month was about what is that incremental benefit of a TUCP, right? Uh, conditions with the TUCP, conditions without a TUCP. Uh, we heard in the presentation from staff earlier about uh, last year's TUCP and how the initial projections were in the 60 to 120,000 acre foot range. And the, actual, the conclusion at the end was that there was a, I think a 289,000 acre foot overall benefit. So I'm, you know, I'm hoping that in our next update from you um, with the forecasting of coming out that we'll get a better sense for, for what that is and what we're actually weighing here uh, in, the, in those types of trade-offs and decision-making that we have to make. Uh, I mean, frankly, and if, if a TUCP, it sounds like a TUCP may not be needed for February, that would be good news. Uh, but if there is one, uh, you know, we're gonna need, I, I personally will need to have a good understanding of what that looks like in terms of the, the net change and, uh, and benefit uh, in storage or, or other benefits that a TUCP would provide. And on, yep. on that, oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to comment. Absolutely. That's what we would be um, talking about on the 18th. I, I do want to remind everybody, though, that the benefit that we saw last year, as well as the benefit that we saw in the last drought of the TUCP uh, in the 2014-2015, those benefits primarily come in the summer. And this TUCP is February through April. So just something to keep in mind that uh, that the, the the summertime is kind of a whole different um, <laughs> whole different animal um, because uh, uh, that's when we're primarily relying on uh, storage releases to to meet system demands. Is where uh, in this winter time period there is the possibility of having quite a bit of unstored water in the system. Yeah, that's fair. So I so on, kind of following on that line. Um, you know, one thing I noticed is that there was um, some, maybe a modeling spreadsheet or some additional information that was posted actually last night on our web, State Water Board website here. And so I haven't had a chance to, to look through that spreadsheet data yet, so I don't know what's in there. But does that get to some of these types of operational numbers in terms of storage and flows and what you were seeing at least as of a few weeks ago? Um, or should we expect more of that type of analysis in the coming weeks here? Molly, did you want to talk about what was submitted? Sure, well, we, sure. we um, did submit some uh, summary of the hydrology data that um, was included into our modeling that supported the, um, the, the TUCP um, that we submitted on uh, December 1st. Um, right now, as we transition with the wetter conditions that we've seen, we're transitioning out of a long-term planning model, say CalSIM, that isn't really appropriate as we march into this current year and we're transitioning to our operational models um, to, to better get a sense of the benefits of ATUCP for this given year. Um, 
and, and we do think that's very important because certainly we don't take the 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 submittal of a TUCP very lightly by any means and certainly understand that to move forward with the TUCP certainly have to provide what those benefits are in the system, especially with our main goal of conserving upstream storage. So um, we're taking all of that into account and the key is just transitioning to those um, operational models that we will be crunching the numbers as we march into, um, as we receive the January forecast um, from our division of flood management. Okay, great. Well, thank you. It sounds like more to come on that. So I look forward to that. There certainly is. And uh, we've had a lot of discussions with board staff and we will continue to do so just about the um, modeling efforts and so forth as we march into this year. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so we're running a little long here. So if, if, are there any other questions? Oh, it sounds like, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I did have a question on, um, and I know that uh, the uh, agencies are likely to submit comments, um, you know, this Friday, but in the meantime, um, we just want to hear your thoughts on any of the uh, proposed conditions uh, that are in the draft order, specifically on, um, I think staff had this on uh, one of their slides. Uh, I'm looking at staff presentation uh, that outlines them on slide 17, uh, submittal of additional requirements on submittal of the uh, temperature management plan, and then also on uh, exports, health and safety, and uh, providing additional information on the, the amounts and what they're used for. Yeah, I can start for reclamation. Um, so I, we're we're working to put together uh, um, comments now, um, but they 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 cross a, a number of different divisions within within our agency, and uh, we don't have all of those <laughs> all of those members on this uh, on this call today to respond. Um, I can respond uh, more specifically to the date. I think uh, Board Member Firestone brought up the date of uh, um, of the temperature management plan. Um, uh, we typically submit a temperature management plan at the end of May, uh, and that's the reservoir typically stratifies around the middle of May. That's Shasta, sorry, um, and and that gives us a good idea about what how much cold water we have and how we can operate our temperature control device in order to uh, to use that throughout the summer. Um, and it also tells us uh, what we what kind of warm water we can release in the springtime. Um, so usually when the temperatures are colder, we want to be releasing warmer water if we have that ability. We didn't have that ability this past year um, because the reservoir was too low. Um, so those are really important things for us to see. Um, uh, those are things we will not know by uh, by mid March, which is um, that's the time period we would have to run all of the analysis for an April submittal, um, and we might have a little bit better idea by mid April, but that's when the reservoir is just barely starting to stratify. So there would be a significant amount of uncertainty by mid April, um, which is when we would have to run models for by May first. So um, just to highlight, there's a lot of um, there might be a lot of uh, uh, adjustments and changes um, after May 1st on something that we've run based on April 15th since the reservoir hasn't stratified yet. All right, thank you. And, and I'll just add in just from DWR's perspective, we're in the same boat as reclamation. The, the order does cross across several couple different divisions and offices. So we're coordinating internally on comments on whether and whether we'll be submitting comments come uh, Friday. All right, thank you. Sorry, uh, Vice Chair, did you have any other questions? Nothing further, thank you. Okay. All right, I just wanna make sure I'm giving everyone a chance here. So, all right, I think we're good. So. I'm going to suggest that we uh, we have one more presentation, and after that, we'll get to uh, public comment. But since we're running a little bit long, I'm going to suggest we take a 10 minute break here and then come back for our last presentation from DWR and then go on from there, if that makes sense to everybody. And uh, that makes sense, but I think we have another panel before public comment that, right? Right. The right. Yeah, there's one, more, there's one more presentation. Right. Um, from Rosemary Hart Hartman, TWR.
So let's do that. So 10 minutes, so we'll be back at 11.20 for that. Thank you.
Welcome back. Ms. Townsend, I just wanna make sure we're ready to continue. Should be good to go. Okay. All right. Um, okay, I'll let you go. We'll talk we later. will be continuing on with um, our last uh, panel. Okay, my Michael. We'll let you go. We'll be continuing on with our last panelist, Rosemary Hartman, with the California Department of Water Resources, doing a presentation on harmful algal blooms and drivers of blooms in 2021 and potential for blooms in 2022. Hi everyone, um, my name is Rosemary Hartman and I'm an environmental program manager from the Department of Water Resources. Uh, there were a number of comments at the last board meeting on the TUCP regarding harmful algal blooms and the relationship between um, flow in the Delta and the increase in concern for, about harmful algal blooms. Uh, Department of Water Resources and USBR uh, put together a report on the impact of the 2021 TUCP and the emergency drought barrier on harmful algal blooms and aquatic weeds in the Delta. So I'm going to give you an update on what we found in that report and uh, an idea of what we might expect for the TUCP that we're discussing today. I'm not going to cover the aquatic weeds part today because that analysis is still ongoing. And even this analysis on the harmful algal blooms um, was somewhat preliminary. We're going to be uh, submitting a update to the report that we've already submitted um, later on this spring when we have some additional data that we've collected. But we did do a lot of analysis and um, have a better understanding of what happened this past year. Uh, next slide, please. So the TUCP last summer was, as uh, Aaron mentioned, beginning in June and July. And uh, one of the critical parts was a reduction in Delta outflow from a minimum of 4,000 cubic feet per second to 3,000 um, in June and July. Next slide. The other aspect uh, that was done in concert with this TUCP that really helped us maintain our uh, water quality at the pumps and upstream storage was an emergency drought barrier in West Falls River, right next to Frank's Tract. And this was the same place and configuration of the barrier that was in place in 2015. And uh, there was a lot of research done on that barrier in 2015. We expect things to be similar. We didn't see a big problem with harmful algal blooms. So that was sort of our um, idea of how this past summer would go. Uh, it was installed in June and originally it was going to be removed this past November. However, as was mentioned earlier, um, the barrier has been left in place and is currently being notched uh, for fish passage over the winter and then uh, filled in later this spring to help us maintain water quality over the summer. Next slide. So when we say harmful algal blooms or HABs or HABs, uh, we're talking about mostly harmful cyanobacteria. So single-celled microscopic organisms that can form large blooms floating in the water. Um, some of the major players in the delta are microcystis, the phanosomenon, delicospermum, the solitoria. Microcystis is the one that has had the most information uh, about it in the delta. It's the one that we see most frequently and in highest abundance. If you're ever out on the delta uh, in the summer, it looks kind of like little flakes of bright green cornflakes almost floating in the water. Um, and it does produce um, liver toxins. However, it doesn't always produce liver toxins and uh, it is often very low levels. So uh, we haven't had a huge problem with uh, toxic impacts in the Delta in the past, but um, it is a continuing concern and has been getting worse and worse over the past 20 years or so. Microcystis was first observed in the Delta in the late 90s, early 2000s, and um, has gotten worse and worse almost every year. A lot of research has been done about the drivers of these harmful algal blooms, and they uh, 
increase in severity with higher temperatures, uh, decreased flow, and increased light availability. So clear, slow-moving warm water is when we see these blooms. Next slide. Fortunately, since we have been seeing this over the past 20 years, a lot of monitoring has started to track the trends in these blooms, try and get at what is driving them, what's causing them. Uh, all of our fish and uh, water quality monitoring surveys that go out in the Delta, when I say are, I mean, the Interagency Ecological Program. So not only Department of Water Resources, but also Reclamation, uh, CDFW, um, US Fish and Wildlife Service, when they're out on the water, they're recording whether or not they see microcystis visually in the water. Um, there are also several surveys that collect crab samples for phytoplankton community composition, see exactly which of these harmful algae might be present. Um, there's a limited number of crab samples that actually look at whether the toxins are present. Um, also various pigment analysis methods using satellite data and continuous water quality probes, as well as a large network of water quality sensors and flow stations. Um, Next slide. So uh, at the last board meeting that this was discussed, uh, there was some public comments asking about why this report wasn't done earlier and wasn't made publicly available earlier. The report is now available on the state board website. And while it took a lot of analysis and time and effort to put all these data together, the raw data are mostly publicly available in near real time. Um, the state board has on their mywaterquality.gov has a great interactive uh, harmful algal bloom tracking map that is available to the public. There's also satellite data available um, on a similar kind of um, web application run by SFEI. USGS has a way to visualize their data and the discrete water quality visual assessments are also available online. So um, while the report involved a lot of analysis that took some time to put together, uh, we try and get the data available as fast as possible. Um, next slide. So putting all these data together, um, what we have here is a graph of just our visual assessments. When we go out there, um, what percentage of those visual assessments see microcystis? And going back to uh, 2007, when we started, first started collecting these data regularly, there's been a kind of steady increase in the number of um, positive observations of microcystis. But in particular, notice the, the years that I've kind of circled in the red boxes, those are our dry drought years. Um, the, from you know, 2012 to 2016, we had really high microcystis observations, hardly any in 2017 when we had that really high flow year. More again in 2018, and then 2020 and 2021 were our highest years ever. Um, doing some statistical analyses just over the past eight years, um, years with the same letter are not significantly different. So um, what we saw was that 2020 had significantly more harmful algal bloom observations than 2021. So they're both really bad, as you can see from the graph. Almost over 50% of all the observations over the summer had these harmful algae in them, but there was slightly more in 2020 than 2021. This tells us that, okay, droughts mean more microcystis. Um, lower flows mean more microcystis. TUCP did have lower flows, but 2020 that actually had higher flows and um, didn't have a TUCP actually had more microcystis. Uh, so what's going on here? Um, for one thing, these data aren't the most reliable. It's somewhat subjective, but we have such a large number of these observations that does tell us something about what's going on. Um, and uh, there's more besides flow and the drought that is contributing. So next slide. The other really key factor in causing these blooms is temperature. And more hot days, especially days 
that reach a uh, water temperature higher than 19 degrees Celsius mean more harmful algal blooms. Drought years, as well as being low flow, also tend to have hotter weather, um, making it hard to pull these things apart. But overall, we see more warm days mean more um, observations of microcystis. And 2020, as was mentioned earlier, was one of the hottest years on record. It started getting hot earlier. You know, the water temperatures reached a higher level earlier in the year in 2020 than they did in 2021. And they stayed hot longer, giving us a slightly longer season for microcystis. Um, next slide. So that was on the delta wide scale. We didn't see as much delta wide slightly in 2021, but um, it was pretty similar for other dry years. However, there was a, a localized incident in Frank's tract. And a lot of these uh, harmful algal blooms tend to be somewhat localized. Um, every year, almost over the past 10 years or so, we've seen blooms in like the Stockton Deepwater Ship Channel, the Turning Basin, and in, um, sorry, totally blanking, uh, some of the marinas or uh, more isolated places with really low flow. And uh, when we put the drought barrier in Frank's track, we reduced the flow in Frank's track. So we were a little worried that reducing the flow in that area might cause, you know, isolated uh, blooms. And we did see that um, in July and August of 2021, Frank's tract uh, had this increase in cyanobacteria, um, higher than we've ever seen in Frank's tract before. Now, was that due to the barrier or just due to the fact that it was a low flow year? Well, we um, not only had modeling showing that flow was really reduced uh, in Frank track due to the barrier, we also decided to compare to another open water area uh, that didn't have a barrier, Mildred Island. And there was a small bloom in Mildred Island, but not as bad as Frank's track. So we think that the barrier probably contributed to the size and severity of the bloom in Frank's tract. Fortunately, um, the toxin analysis from grab samples showed that the amount of actual harmful toxins produced by this bloom was pretty low. Um, it was just barely above the uh, caution level for drinking water and it was below the caution level for recreational use. So um, it could have been worse. It was definitely not anything near what was seen at Clear Lake this past summer. And none of these toxins were detected at Clifton Court. Um, so got off a little easy, but we really want to step up our monitoring this coming year and make sure that we can uh, get on top of things as soon as possible and really make sure we understand anything that does happen. Um, next slide. So overall, we didn't find evidence for a strong effect of the TCP on the Delta wide scale. However, overall, it was also a really bad year for harmful algae in the Delta, um, similar to 2020. The emergency drought barrier probably did contribute to the uh, bloom that we saw in Frank's tract. Um, and we really need more monitoring of cyanotoxins in particular. We only had a couple grab samples that were conducted by the regional board uh, in Frank's tract. And so this coming year, DWR is starting regular grab samples for cyanotoxins. We're also expanding an existing um, study that we're doing in partnership with USGS uh, to put um, a sort of a benthic sampler uh, that is put in place in Frank's tract that will absorb toxins over you know, the course of several weeks, allowing us to know what's going on in between our grab samples. Um, and uh, making sure we are getting a contingency plan together for reporting and notification if we see anything. Next slide. Uh, we're also investigating mitigation and control options. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a great toolkit. We've got a work group that is looking into ideas um, mostly focusing on the local scale because that seems to be where most of the problems are associated with the drought barrier, uh, stuff that we can do just in Frank's tract. 
things that might help on the delta wide scale is a little out of the scope of you know the barrier um, in particular and we need a little more information about how nutrients uh, are really participating in bloom development before we can call for you know a basin wide nutrient management plan um, but we're looking into what we could do, especially in like some of the marinas around Frank's tract, such as improving water mixing, potentially algicide, skimming, but it's still a, sort of a conceptual level. Um, however, we do want to get on top of things. And the most important thing we're doing is stepping up monitoring so that we can better understand the drivers behind these so we can get the um, prevent the blooms at the source rather than trying to uh, control them after they've started. Next slide. So the um, next to UCP that is on the table here is for February through April. And while there were some public comments about what this new to UCP would mean for harmful algal blooms, February through April it's just too cold for us to see any harmful algal blooms. No matter how much we decrease the flow in the Delta, uh, if we don't have temperatures above that 19 degree cutoff, we're not gonna see these massive blooms that we see every summer. This graph just kind of shows you um, by month, how often we see microcystis in the water. And you can see that January through April, we hardly ever see any. So um, while, we're starting up this monitoring so that we're prepared for the summer, especially with the emergency drought barrier staying in place. We're not um, super concerned with uh, the potential for blooms forming uh, during the February through April timeframe. Um, and uh, last slide, I think it's just questions. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Hartman, for the presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? Sure, I have a question. Um, so, um, well, one question is when you are in your conclusions um, on flows, was it that HABs, um, that the reduced flows weren't exacerbating um, or weren't the main driver of HABs um, in the Delta overall? Well, it's very difficult to extract exactly which drivers are the main driver versus exacerbating ways. Um, flow is definitely a driving factor, um, however, because uh, of the fact that we didn't see a difference. There was a very small difference between 2020 where we didn't reduce flows in 2021. And the direction of that difference was that 2021 with reduced flows had lower levels of harmful algal blooms. So um, it pro the TOCP probably did not exacerbate the blooms, probably. It's very difficult to be really conclusive here. So, right. Yeah. Because yeah. you're not looking at the other, like maybe some of the other variables improved, um, and it would have improved more if we yeah, had. Yeah. Exactly. So. It, it could have for sure, and <clears throat> you know the general. There's a a pretty good relationship um, between flow and uh, harmful algal blooms, and you know if you just look at the slope of the relationship and you know a shift in a uh, hundred thousand CFS outflow, you would expect that to exacerbate the blooms. So it was probably you know part of the the ball game, um, but it would not have made the difference between. Uh, you know, having blooms and not having blooms. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the um, kind of themes for us on with reconsideration of our last TCP and thinking about what we're learning going into um, 
any future ones <laughs> there's you know considering one um which may get pulled or may not um is what information do we need to have to be able to um really answer that answer the question of um what are significant impacts um that may result from it, you know the balancing that we're making. And so from your, you know, from this research, what are the additional pieces of information that we will have to help inform that going into the next TUCP that may be better than what we had going into this last TCP? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a tough question. Um, to a certain extent, uh, comparing the last TUCP and the one, when you say the next TUCP, are you talking about another summer yeah. TUCP? Or no, <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe both, right? So um, yeah. I think this is most like your point of this is most relevant for a summer TUCP. Um, so maybe it's more relevant to that, not to say that it's, you know, not at all an issue. Um, I'm not sure, but I think certainly the it's, it's more relevant to another, a future summer one. Yeah, yeah. So I think so far we haven't learned anything like new and earth shattering with this analysis, but we've reinforced the idea that temperature is really key. And unfortunately we don't have a lot of control on water temperature. Um, so I've been, you know, racking my head over like, how do we respond to this problem? And like, what are these mitigation methods we can use? Um, I think we have, um, with this analysis, we reinforce our idea that temperature is one of the keys. Flow is another key, but it sort of only gets you so far. And then temperature kind of is the controlling factor. The way I have read this data and as I mentioned we are doing a follow-up to this report when we have some more data that is currently coming in. Um, one of the other key things that we've learned here is we know a lot about microcystis but there are other emerging taxa that have potentially different drivers and different um, phenologies, probably different temperature thresholds that we don't know as much about. And I think putting this together highlighted our need to learn more about those taxa. Um, the other thing that we didn't do a good enough job on is monitoring the cyanotoxins. So um, from what we saw, we did not have levels that were a huge problem, but as our amount of cyanobacteria keeps going up and up every year, we could get to that point and we need to increase our monitoring um, and make sure we have robust methods for notifying the public if we see a problem. Um, yeah, as far as the TUCP in particular, there didn't seem to be, it wasn't the smoking gun. So um, figuring out what basin wide drivers we do have a real effect on um, before we think about, you know, a potential another summer TUCP, if it is gonna exacerbate anything, like what, what are the other, what temperature controls do we have? What nutrient controls should we look into? Um, and how do we notify the public, I guess, if we see a problem? Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, 
On some of the monitoring points that you raised or, or um, you know, need for better, more extensive monitoring, and also it sounds like more under, is it also monitoring around those other taxa of, um, mm -hmm. so, um, I, you know, one question is, I know there is a lot, you know, that I believe some, some work through, um, the Delta Stewardship Council Science um, work, as well as some community groups um, work with the, you know, certainly at the Water Board, we, I think the Central Valley Regional Board and others are doing work. So I'm curious how this work is working with those other efforts and how is yeah. that kind of coordination and analysis and monitoring being coordinated? Definitely. Um, and that's, it hasn't been super well coordinated up until this past year. I think there's been, frankly, there's been a lot of uh, passing the buck of no one wants to have cyanotoxin monitoring land in their lap um, because then they're in charge of it forever. Um, but there's the work that the state and regional boards are doing. Um, there's, you know, the work that the Delta Science Program is funding are you know, special studies. They're not long-term monitoring programs. Um, DWR has um, relatively recently implemented monitoring at the pumping facilities. Um, and a, a new sort of work team has formed recently. Uh, their first official meeting, I think is next week actually, um, to kind of be a clearinghouse for these different studies. And uh, I think setting up that group to coordinate and share data, um, making sure everyone knows just what is going on, uh, because a lot of like the special studies especially have a particular academic question that they're answering. It's not a let's just do status and trends and inform the public about what's going on. Um, with the regional board's work, it's someone has to report an uh, incident. And then if it's bad enough, they'll go out and look at the cyanotoxins. It's not a let's just go every day and check just to make sure. And so um, we're implementing some of that uh, in the region around Frank's Tract this coming summer for at least the next two years. Uh, but just to get the status and trends monitoring going on the broad scale, that's kind of a, a larger conversation that we haven't um, turned out yet. All right, thanks. And um, I mean, at least we're starting and hopefully we can do a, um, a better job of that. That's always a challenge. I think that um, I'm, I'm interested also within this, the monitoring that's going on um, and sort of coordination that hopefully will, will continue to grow and improve. Um, how are we incorporating, identifying, um, you know, vulnerable populations, um, environmental justice areas around um, disproportionate impacts where there are concentrations of um, low-income communities, communities of color in the Delta that um, may be more exposed or disproportionately exposed. Um, is there monitoring that is going on or design that can be done, um, especially going forward to help uh, support an analysis to better understand that. Um, and, and I guess one thing I'll mention, I think I've mentioned in the past um, on these is, I do know there's some community groups um, in Stockton that are doing monitoring, um, like, you know, community-based monitoring um, in, have been trained and worked working um, in coordination with agencies to make sure there's QA, QC to help inform um, and just gather more data in those areas that are more vulnerable and particularly high concentrations of low-income communities, communities of color. So just would love to see that as something that could be 
deliberate and expanded in terms of developing monitoring and understanding of potential impacts and dynamics um, in terms of, you know, certainly this, this context with GWR and also just the broader um, coordination around hubs and the Delta in terms of really understanding those dynamics. Like you said, it's, it, it's, you know, we have we have an, we have the TCP is one context that we're focused on today. You know, the regional board does um, does nutrient um, regulation. Like, there's you know so many different factors, and yeah, temperature we can't control as well. Um, but the you know there are things that we do have control, and both of them are major drivers, flows as well as nutrients, right? And so. It's, it, you know, both need to be addressed um, and we can't, you know, if anything, we have to compensate for the increasing temperatures that we're dealing with now with climate change. So anyway, I do, I hope we can expand, um, you know, the, both the data and analysis and um, coordination and, and just, you know, continue drilling down to understanding what, it, what, like you said, what are the impacts um, or ways that this might be exacerbating and what are the ways that we can um, address that? Um, you know, certainly in this context, it's within the, within a TUCP. And I know for all of us, we want to see it even up, you know, even in, in other contexts as well. Definitely. Um, there was a lot there. Uh, <laughs> what, so to be honest, I have not thought about underrepresented communities in this context. I do know that it is a uh, important area and it is something that DWR is trying to do better at. Um, so what I am going to definitely do is bring this up at the work group meeting next week to find out you know, who, what is available, what social scientists are available. The monitoring program that DWR is putting in place for the coming year is really targeted towards the Franks Tract area to look at the impacts of the barrier um, because that's where we saw the most impacts in this analysis. Um, and so our monitoring is trying to get at places where we think the, we, the um, harmful algal blooms will be worse in that general area. But um, definitely in trying to come up with some kind of broader scale, a uh, monitoring program for the Delta as a whole and a solution for the Delta as a whole really does need to bring in the underrepresented communities, the community monitoring programs, um, making sure we're targeting the places that are most affected by these issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that that's, I appreciate that. And I, I, I would hope that's, you know, not just in the broader one, but also in how you're designing things going forward with DWR yeah. as well with us. So yeah, appreciate that. Um, really appreciate that, just the um, discussion and work and analysis and ongoing work on this. And I, I do think it's um, increasingly, you know, a major concern and certainly um, just part of the balancing that we need to be doing um, at the board and, and also just at the state. So um, appreciate that. I think I don't have other questions, Vice Chair, did you? Okay. Thank you, board member Firestone. And thank you for the discussion. Do we have any other questions? Okay, hearing none. Thank you, Ms. Hartman, um, for the presentation and the discussion. Okay. Much appreciated. I just have a quick ask. Yes. Um, just, um, I greatly appreciate just the conversation and the presentation. I just ask, you know, as additional information or data becomes available, especially around, you know, temperature, because just as the discussion we just, that was just had, you know, temperature is a major factor in, you know, HABs and harmful al algal fumes. So along with, you know, showing, you know, um, the, the years, gra graphs on the years and um, presenting the, the flow data, if temperature data is also available, if that could be included in future presentations and data that's presented to us, that would be very helpful. Um, so to understand like the difference between 2020 and 2021, I think that's a key factor in understanding the difference in um, you know, what happened between those two years. So. Certainly, and um, there's a 
pretty extensive analysis of temperature in the full report. I was trying to figure out what the, the top, you know, four graphs to show everyone today were, but um, yes. All right, and how could uh, we access that report? Um, the report is on the State Board website under, um, you know, the TUCP Condition 8. Um, I think the title is something not useful, like email referring to uh, Condition 8. Um, but I can uh, make sure and send you the link or uh, feel free to reach out. Anyone at DWR can send you a copy. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Just really looking for the information for the public to be able to access gotcha. it. Gotcha. That's yes. terrific. Yes. Great. Okay, any other questions? All right, Just thank on you, that, Carmen. Hopefully our staff can, can help make sure that that's you know, more obviously available. And then um, I also know that there's a whole site on HABs in um, at the, the, in the broader state board work. So just making sure there's availability in both those areas um, as we make sure it's publicly yes. accessible. Appreciate that. Ms. Riddle? I just wanted to let you know, we will retitle that report. Um, the, a lot has happened over the holidays, so we'll make sure that that's clear, clearly identified on our website. Terrific. And uh, TWR is working to um, get it on our website as well. We just had some um, uh, accessibility things to check off before we can post it. Okay, very good. Now we're going to move on to our uh, public comment, but before doing so, um, just want to get a sense of um, the energy level here um, by my colleagues. Um, I'm thinking in light of the fact that we uh, did have a, a late morning break that maybe we could get started and then take a break for a later lunch at um, 1230 or one o'clock and just want to get your sense. We have uh, 38 speakers, you know, quite a lot of interest, and I think about 10 of them have indicated speak only if necessary. I would say we, let's try and get through some of this. I know um, it's been a long morning already, and we might have some folks drop off. Um, so I think it'd be good to try and get to as many as we can before lunch. Right. Okay. Any other comments? All right, so we'll go ahead and get started and um, uh, target uh, one o'clock for our break, um, a half an hour lunch break. Um, I have that same concern, board member McGuire. We don't want to lose people. There's quite a lot of interest here. Uh, the other thing is we do we are allocating for five minutes per speaker, but don't feel um, that you need to, for those of you who are planning on commenting, don't feel that you need to fill up that time. There are some speakers that have presentations, so you know that time will likely be needed. Uh, but um, uh, you know, will you be able to also monitor uh, the clock that's also um, on the website? All right. So our first speaker is uh, Thad Bettner with Glen Calusa Irrigation District. Hello, Vice Chair. Good morning. Hopefully you can hear me. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Just uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment this morning. I uh, want to thank the board members and staff and also the presentation so far. Um, you know, I think just for us, first, I just want to reiterate um, as at least our district, you know, the settlement contractors, um, our continued um, support and desire to find collaborative solutions. Uh, we provided letters this year in terms of actions that we were voluntarily taking to try. Um, and get through this year. And I think, again, we're committed to doing that um, for this um, upcoming year as well. Um, you know, certainly I think we were somewhat disappointed by some of the, the comments that were, or, or, you know, would have liked to see some more positive comments in terms of how the species are doing um, in the report. And we're in the order, you know, certainly we've seen improvements in the number of adults returning, as well as uh, migrants out of the system. So, just more positive news in terms of the status of the species. And I also saw that, you know, it looks like there's going to be potentially a workshop in March uh, to have that opportunity to talk more about the status of the species. So again, we'll, we'll, we'll look forward to that and working with your staff about, you know, trying to put together a presentation or panel on that. So certainly interested in that. Um, I know there's been some news in the last couple of days about um, winter run survival. Um, you know, and I just would like to say that, um, you know, National Fishery Service did a brood year report in for 2019 year, which we work with them on. 
And based on the number of returning adults, you know, likely egg to survival this year would have been, you know, most about 18%. So I know there's been going to be talk um, there in the papers. I'm sure some of the other panelists will be talking about low survival this year and talking about two and a half percent. But really, it's not two and a half percent of 100. It's really, you know, about 18 percent was about as good as we'd expect an egg to survival to be based on the number of adults. So again, some things we just like to see, you know, included um, in the order to just provide some context um, going forward. Um, just some global comments. Um, you know, one, I think we would like to see the orders separated. I mean, I think there are some distinctive difference between the TUCP and the temperature management plan. So I know um, board member McGuire talked about some of the reasoning why they were combined, but I think given some of the details that may need to be addressed for each one of those, it may be good to separate those and dive a little bit more into the operation issues associated with each. Um, regarding the temperature management plan, you know, I think just a better idea of the reason some of the um, targets weren't met, you know, was it the storage target? Was it a temperature target? And what were some of the reasons for each of those? I think it'd be good to also include in the order. Um, <clears throat> you know, around um, the operations, I think there were some significant things that happened in 2021 that affected Chasta storage. Um, you know, one, you know, obviously some of the panels will refer to our diversions, that's fine. But I know um, certainly the state of California did not meet its um, flow obligation on the coordinated operations agreement, also referred to as COA. Certainly the um, delay in the water rights curtailment um, until August 19th required that more water be released from storage. Um, so, you know, both of those had a significant impact on storage in Shasta, um, as well as curtailing other illegal diversions of stored water. And then lastly, there were some storage targets set at Folsom and Oroville, and I think those also redirected some impacts to Shasta. So, you know, we would like to see more of a, a water balance or water budget included in the order um, that would have a summary of all these uses, including inflows, outflows, um, diversions in the Delta, et cetera. So again, I think a better water balance and budget would allow a better idea of really what happened in the system this year. Interestingly enough, um, I think recommendation number four um, that you have in the order requires this for 2022. So having also looking back at the, the previous year's data in 2021 would be helpful. And then lastly, I think we would just say, um, you know, there has been some modeling uh, uh, documented in the order. And, you know, we would just ask that, that all that modeling that's gonna be relied on for decision-making be publicly available. Um, there was a modeling workshop um, on April 21 in 2021 uh, where different models were talked about. And I think we asked at that time that those models also be publicly available. So, you know, there's a lot of decisions that are being relied upon in terms of our environment, uh, economy, et cetera, and not having models that are publicly available certainly is problematic. And I think with that, I'll conclude my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bettner. The next speaker is Barbara Berrigan Perea from Restore the Delta. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Good afternoon. Um, and thank you um, for the opportunity to speak. I have several points to make today regarding the draft TUCP order that may or may not happen in February, but then later. Um, first, I want to say that we continue to be grateful for daily coordinated efforts with regional and state board staff to solve on the ground Delta challenges. Our deep disappointment continues to be with orders put forward in relation to management of the estuary. Um, we in California repeatedly gut Delta protections under the terms of temporary emergency orders, and then we lament on Delta conditions afterward. If this is the only plan, that DWR and the Bureau can envision, then what is the future for the estuary? The fish cannot wait three years for the Bay Delta plan with salmon mortality rates as reported by the SAC B for 2021. Delta smelt extinction is already on our doorstep. Listening to DWR science leaders this, this morning and their modelers talk about not having funding for the best data equipment uh, when we think of how much funding by the Department of Resources has been spent on failed voluntary agreements and dry tunnel planning, 
really reveals a failed planning vision for California water management. Uh, the presentation that was just given by DWR on harmful algal blooms was completely inadequate and left out very important details for this board. Dangerous levels of cyanobacteria were found near Stockton and Discovery Bay over the last two years. That was not mentioned to you. Our science coordinator, Spencer Fern, found cyanobacteria present in Stockton waterways last week, which is the HABs off season, and re really indicates that we have deteriorated conditions with probable benthic mats that have sunk in the delta of harmful algal blooms. This requires you know, really good testing, uh, including sediment testing, uh, so that we could get a handle on what's happening. If we never meet water quality and quantity standards, we will never heal from HAPS. DWR science has not been made publicly available and I'm guessing has not been peer reviewed. We remain skeptical. Also, there were very likely fewer occurrences in 2021 and not that, and if the, the, the number is very small because uh, we had more cloudy days earlier in the summer due to fires. The algae doesn't rise uh, when we have a week or two of cloudy days, we have noted the last couple of years because of uh, overcast skies from fires. We have plans, sophisticated plans for water recirculation projects near Stockton. DWR was made aware in 2019 and has never followed up with us. We have advised DWR repeatedly for years about the link between HABs and disadvantaged communities and for their staff not to be thinking about it to us at this point in time is absolutely mind boggling. Blooms grow uh, due to warm water, lack of flow, sunlight and discharge. All these areas have to be dealt with because new HABs are popping up in new areas as conditions deteriorate. Blooms will settle and worsen each year. Kel Water Boards, you have experts on your staff on this topic. Um, I believe the DWR report needs follow-up from your experts. This is why for 2022, uh, you should request a revised order that also demonstrates full shared sacrifice by all parties in California, not just the people of the Delta, so that we can improve water quality conditions. A new order should require DWR and reclamation to curtail water deliveries water diversions and allocations to all contractors of the CVP and SWP, including settlement and exchange contractors, except for water diversions necessary for human health and safety and wildlife, until we get a handle on what is happening. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Schutz with the California Sports Fishing Protection Alliance. I shared the Adamo. He actually has um, taken um, a break away for a minute for another meeting. So we'll move him down on the list. Okay. Sounds good. And then um, Chandra Chilla McCurry only um, if needed. Mr. Chilla McCurry. Yeah. Hi. Um, sorry. I was trying to unmute myself. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good thank afternoon. you. Um, I'll just uh, keep make this brief, but um, I'll start off with the December 15 draft order granting in part and denying in part petitions for reconsideration of its of uh, your uh, June 1st approval of 2021 TUCP. Um, Steward contractors recommend re removal of references to the state and federal government's proposed interim operations plan and future provincial court order from that from your draft order. The interim operations plan was improperly present, presented to the federal court without any analysis of whether the proposed changes in the CVP and SWP operations will have significant impacts on species, water quality, storage, or water deliveries. As the water board is aware, such changes to project operations can have unintended neg negative environmental consequences. Without analysis, there is no way to know how the interim operations plan could affect the environment. Also, no modeling was provided to show that the operating to the carryover storage targets or the temperature targets included in this plan are even possible. The water board does not have any administrative record to support the reference to interim operations plan in an order related to the 
2021 TUCP. Also, it is unclear to us as to what would happen if the court does not issue an order adopting the interim operations plan. State water contractors instead recommend that reference to the interim operations plan be removed from the December 15 draft order and the water board use its existing decision 90-5 process for determining appropriate in-stream temperature requirements for Sacramento River, taking into consideration the latest forecasts. I'll uh, take a minute um, and provide brief comments on the December 1st TUCP for your consideration, even though we are, um, it is uncertain that we will need a TUCP this year. State work contractors support departments and recommendations on December application for a TCP. If water year 2022 hydrology cannot reverse the hydrologic deficits from the last two years, this TUCP will be a very important tool for state water project and Central Valley project to meet their environmental water quality and water supply obligations yes. later in the year and future years. By preserving upstream storage in Shasta, Oroville and or other reservoirs. As you are considering approval of the TUCP, please note that last year, state water project was operated to preserve upstream storage, storage levels to the maximum extent possible. And delivery east to the south of Delta X state water project, public water agencies were primarily provided from San Luis Reservoir. We believe that DWR's analysis of the TUCP is reasonable and supports the approval of the TUCP. The low entrainment risk combined with potential benefits of the greater upstream storage with TUCP will potentially minimize the drought-related impacts to the listed species. We also would like to stress the importance of the 1500 CFS minimum combined CVP and SVP pumping to provide human health and safety needs in addition to other critical needs such as the water supplies to south of Delta refuges. The minimum export levels also enable operational ex exchanges among various south of Delta public water agencies and provide water supply to steward project contractors with minimum, minimal local storage. In closing, the state water contractors are relieved that we had good presentation so far this year, and we hope that a TUCP will not be necessary. If it is necessary, we hope that the board will continue to work with DWR and reclamation and appropriately balance human health and safety needs with the species needs by approving the TUCP. In addition, we request the water board to continue tracking hydrology in the real time and issue curtailment notice, notices to protect stored water supplies as appropriate. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chilla McCurry. Next, we have Joseph Rizzi. Ms. Townsend. Um, sorry, I thought it was on mute, uh, unmute. Uh, Mr. Rizzi is not on the platform at this time, so the next person would be Spencer Fern. All right. Mr. Fern, good afternoon. Hello. Hello. Okay. You guys, am I hearing fine? Hearing me fine? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, good afternoon, board members. Um, my name is Spencer Fern, and I'm the new science coordinator with uh, Restore the Delta. I have a degree in microbiology, and I grew up in Stockton and used to go boating around the Delta. So the Delta is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm going to be working on water quality assessment in regard to harmful algal blooms. So we've already kind of covered that topic today. And I'd like to thank Region 5 for collaborating and helping us set up those tests. Now onto the topic of maintaining water quality. I believe that it is important to keep those standards in place to help lower the amount of harmful algal blooms we see each summer. And uh, more importantly, making sure that the runoff is properly managed to not give a nutrient load for the harmful algal blooms to prosper. But that's why the standards are set in the first place is so that we can ensure the water way can continue to be safe to be around. And as Barbara mentioned earlier in her comments, I did go out with some interns last week, specifically Thursday of last week to get a baseline test for uh, microcystins. So I said that's one of the specific cyanobacteria that they were talking about in, the, uh, in their presentation, which is the, the more like, it's one of the ones that covers some more of the liver or and, like the problems with humans for the most part. And uh, we went to the Morelli boat landing, which is right under the I-5 in Stockton, if you're familiar with the area. And even though there wasn't a harmful algal bloom 
visually present, there were still five to 10 parts per billion of microcystins, which is rather concerning for the water quality because it's not even summertime, which is they're claiming that it's not gonna be a problem during the winter, but only the summer, but clearly that's not the case. Um, I hope to continue doing testing in the future and obviously the best result would be to find no value for them, but I fear the worst because uh, microcystins seem to be here to stay and uh, they have adverse effects on not only humans, but pets too. So this is why I urge that we keep the standards and if not, we can continue to see worse to worse Hab seasons, which seem to extend into the winter now. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Mr. Fern. Next, we have uh, Doug Obiji with NRDC. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Vice Chair, members of the board and staff. I am Doug Obiji. I'm a senior attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, we will be following up with written comments on both the draft order and the 2022 TUCP um, but I really appreciate the opportunity and the board's insistence on providing enough lead time to provide public comment in advance. Uh, I'd like to talk about the draft order on reconsideration first. Um, NRDC encourages the board to reject the draft order as written and revise it to address three fundamental points. First, the board should find that the actions taken in 2021 to approve the TUCP and approve the Shasta Temperature Management Plan were not reasonable and not appropriate and failed to provide reasonable protection of fish and wildlife. Most notably, the Shasta Temperature Management Plan resulted in 75% of the eggs of win endangered winter run Chinook salmon being killed by lethal water temperatures, known as temperature dependent mortality, and only 2.56% of the eggs surviving as fry at Red Bluff Diversion Dam, which is the lowest level observed in the past several decades. It's likely that approval of the Shasta Temperature Management Plan resulted in similarly devastating results in terms of mortality of full run of salmon. If the board doesn't believe that killing more than 75% of the endangered winter run salmon is unreasonable effects on fish and wildlife, what would be? Second, that mortality was entirely foreseeable when the Shasta Temperature Management was approved by the executive director. For instance, NIMS has shown in April 2021 that reducing reservoir releases and allocations to these contractors, primarily the settlement exchange contractors, would have significantly reduced temperature mortality. Yet the board did not require reclamation to reduce water supply allocations to their contractors, um, including settlement exchange contractors as required by Water Rights Order 90-5. The board has previously explained that reducing those allocations to settlement contractors are factors within reclamation's control. Yet in 2021, the CPP and State Water Project allocated more than 4 million acre feet of water to their contractors, the vast majority of which went to agricultural uses, not human health and safety. And the result was devastating mortality upstream, violations of water quality standards in April, and the TUCP that allowed them to violate water quality objectives in the summer. In addition, it was entirely foreseeable that granting the TUCP in 2021 would not result in adequate temperature protection upstream, given the failure of TUCPs to do so in 2014 and 2015. And as expected, granting the TUCP did not avoid devastating mortality upstream this year. Lastly, uh, with respect to why the board should find that the actions last year were unreasonable, as the board acknowledges in the draft order, the board has repeatedly found that the minimum protections in decision 1641, those water quality objectives, fail to provide reasonable protection for fish and wildlife. And the board in early 2016, in order Water Rights Order 2015-0043, found that we need to revise the drought planning and management process to avoid leading to extinction. Yet once again in 2021, the board granted a TUCP that waived compliance with these already acknowledged to be inadequate water quality objectives, resulting in worse impacts to fish and wildlife than the inadequate protections under D1641. In order to break this cycle, this pattern and practice of the board waiving water quality objectives in droughts, the board needs to admit that doing so is unreasonable and is leading to these unreasonable results. Second, we agree that additional terms and conditions on the operations of the projects are necessary in 2022, but the proposed terms and conditions to incorporate the interim operations plan, known as the IOP, are woefully inadequate to meet the requirements of the Endangered Species Act and California Endangered Species Act, let alone the board's legal obligations, which are much broader and include obligations under the public trust and protections for the salmon fishery under order 90-5. It's improper to rely solely on ESA protections to meet the requirements under order 
And NIMS has already admitted in court that we that they anticipate that under the interim operations plan, we would see temperature dependent mortality ranging from 34 to 73 percent if 2022 is dry or critically dry. The IOP, the interim operations plan, is inadequate to meet the requirements of the federal and state endangered species acts, let alone the board's legal obligations. Finally, we strongly urge the board to require to impose terms and conditions on the CVP and state water project to require them to eliminate their water allocations, deliveries, and diversions by all of their contractors, including settlement and exchange contractors, except for water deliveries necessary for human health and safety or wildlife refuges, unless they can show that they will meet adequate Shasta storage and temperature protections and meet Delta water quality objectives. It is fundamentally unreasonable to allow the projects to continue violating the public trust obligations and water rights obligations to the public to protect fish and wildlife while continuing to rely on their water rights to divert water for their contractors. For those reasons, we urge the board to, to reject the draft order as proposed and to revise it accordingly, and we will follow up in writing. Secondly, with respect to the TUCP order, and I realize I'm over time, we urge the board to deny the TUCP because it fails to provide reasonable protection of fish and wildlife, is not in the public interest because it does not require the CVP and state water project to reduce contract allocations, including their settlement exchange contractors, and because DWR and Reclamation have failed to exercise due diligence. We appreciate that DWR and Reclamation have acknowledged that there may not be an urgent need for this change, um, but we, we will be following up to provide specific comments and we urge the board if it is going to grant the TUCP to eliminate the 1500 CFS minimum pumping, which far exceeds what is necessary for human health and safety and is primarily to support agricultural water deliveries. And second, to prohibit reclamation and DWR from making any water supply allocations to their contractors except those needed for human health and safety. Thank you for consideration of our comments. Thank you, Mr. OBG. Next is Gary Bobker with the Bay Institute. Great. Can no. you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair, members of the board. My name is Gary Bobker. I'm the program director at the Bay Institute. Uh, we will be submitting written comments um, and uh, it, jointly with NRDC and other groups. And Doug uh, covered much of what's in there. Um, I wanted to sort of just take a step back and talk about the bigger picture here. Um, you know, we heard a lot this morning about extreme conditions and you know how to how to anticipate them how they impact operations etc certainly um dealing with extreme conditions is something real and something that requires us to take active measures but extreme conditions are not really the sole or even necessarily the central issue in the TUCPs uh, either last year or this year uh water allocation decisions really are a large driver of what's going on the TUCPs, in effect, function as a get out of jail free card uh, for water project uh, operators to draw down their water supply bank accounts uh, to make discretionary payments uh, for, for some consumptive water users, uh, and then to declare bankruptcy when it comes to paying off their fish and wildlife obligations. Um, so essentially, when the board permits uh, the TUCPs as proposed, as largely proposed, essentially what you're doing is you're transferring water from the fish and wildlife requirements of the water quality control plan to the settlement and exchange contractors on the Sacramento, San Joaquin, and Feather Rivers. That's not a moral judgment. Um, it, the issue is not whether those um, settlement exchange contractors are good or better or worse than other water users. It's simply that they are privileged um, and the system, the projects are operated to benefit them. Uh, the TUCPs essentially allow um, allocation decisions to be made that draw down storage uh, both in advance of TUCPs and then uh, during TUCPs uh, when those deliveries continue to those water users. And the allocations uh, uh, remain high, relatively high, even when they are reduced drastically or cut off for other users, uh, as you're well aware. Um, and that has the effect, of course, of compromising the cold water storage that is supposed to be um, protected when TUCPs are granted. All of this has the effect of 
damaging fish and wildlife resources, perhaps irreparably. No one makes a credible argument that not complying with the water quality control plan and implementing the TUCPs will not cause harm to fish and wildlife. Reducing delta inflows and outflows will harm estuarine species, and those estuarine species are, are at record or near record lows for many of those populations. Those protections, those regulatory minima are already acknowledged to be in, inefficient, uh, I'm sorry, to be um, deficient by the state water board. Um, yet here we are in, in a situation where uh, because conditions are poor, uh, they're justified, the TUCPs are justified as well, things are poor, so um, relaxing protections doesn't really matter. It's sort of analogous to saying that the patient is near death, so um, there's really no need to maintain a life support uh, system in order to try to save the patient. It makes absolutely no sense. So the combination of relaxing the water quality objectives in the estuary and compromising upwater uh, cold water storage uh, by uh, unsustainable allocations creates uh, uh, a system where uh, it creates an impact which is under no circumstance uh, can be considered reasonable. Um, so, you know, what's the cliche that insanity is, um, is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the same result. Um, you know, the, the, the members of the state water board are many things, insane is not um, a word I would apply to you. Um, this, you've seen what's happened year after year um, and it's time to stop simply repeating the mistakes that we have made before. So uh, we urge you to reject the TUCP as proposed and revise the order reconsidering the previous TUCP in order to acknowledge that number one, the impacts to fish and wildlife are unreasonable and were unreasonable and can be prevented. And to prevent those impacts by prohibiting uh, diversions, exports, allocations, when water quality standards and the water quality control plan are not being met, with the exception of deliveries for public health and safety, but then to also define strictly what public health and safety means in order to ensure that deliveries which are not consistent with that criterion are not included. Um, you really, you know, <laughs> the, the, maybe in 2014 you might have had an excuse, but in 2022 you don't. Um, we urge you to, to deny the TUCP as proposed to consider the conditions that uh, we're suggesting uh, and to revise the order uh, regarding the reconsideration accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bobker. Next is uh, Rachel Zwellinger with Defenders of Wildlife. Hello. Oh. Can you hear me now? There, we can hear you now. Thanks. Great. Good afternoon. I'm Rachel Zwillinger, an attorney and water policy advisor with Defenders of Wildlife. Um, along with the Bay Institute, NRDC, and others, we also intend to submit detailed comments later this week. Um, and I want to make just a few key points today about the draft order and the 2022 TUCP request. Um, but I also think it's important to start with a little bit of context that I don't think came out adequately in this morning's presentation. And that is just to underscore that 2021 was a horrendous year for wildlife in the Bay Delta estuary and its watershed. It was a second consecutive catastrophic year for endangered winter run Chinook salmon with new numbers indicating egg to fry survival of less than 3%. This mortality was primarily caused by high water temperatures, um, which is an impact that falls squarely within the board's regulatory authority. Delta smelt and longfin smelt suffered from reduced flows and diminished habitat and harmful algal blooms proliferated in the Delta. These outcomes weren't the result of drought alone. They were permitted by water management decisions that failed to prioritize the health of the Bay Delta estuary and the wildlife and communities that depend on it. I think the board has an opportunity to do better in 2022, and I hope that you'll take it. With respect to the draft order, 
I want to highlight the inappropriateness of incorporation of the interim operations plan as a condition for operation of the projects. While the draft order is carefully crafted to establish the IOP as a floor for protection, it includes a suggestion that a temperature management plan consistent with requirements of the IOP would suffice from the board's perspective and under its authorities under 90-5. Um, this is problematic for two primary reasons. First, the IOP is exclusively focused on ESA listed species and was developed in the ESA context around a jeopardy framework. The board has an obligation to protect a broader suite of species, including fall and Chinook salmon and the salmon fishery, and is supposed to be protecting fish and wildlife beneficial uses and the public trust, rather than merely avoiding extinction. Reliance on the IOP establishes an inappropriately low bar for success and ignores species that the board has a unique duty to safeguard. Second, even for the limited purposes it is intended to serve, the IOP is completely inadequate. Expert analysis indicates that its implementation would be disastrous for winter run Chinook salmon and other species it is proposed, supposed to protect, making an already precarious situation worse. For the Water Board to rely on the IOP rather than exercising its independent legal authorities would be an abdication of responsibility, and it would be a disaster for the species that we're all interested in safeguarding for future generations. With respect to the 2022 TUCP, should DWR and Reclamation choose to proceed, I urge the Board to consider its priorities and its obligations to the public. It appears that planning for drought once again means unnecessarily wasting to waive critical environmental protections while still diverting enormous quantities of water to agricultural senior water rights holders. Placing profits above protection of the public trust is not in the public's interest and is inconsistent with the board's legal obligations. Further, the political pressure to ramp up water supply allocations in light of recent rainfall and robust snowpack will be profound. And the prospect of the board waiving protections for wildlife to set the stage for increased diversions later in the year is distressing. DWR and Reclamation will continue to seek to violate environmental protections year after year to the detriment of Bay Delta Fish and Wildlife and all of the jobs and communities it supports, unless and until the board is willing to put a stop to this exploitative process. I urge the board to act in the public interest and to finally say no. If DWR and Reclamation proceed with seeking a TUCP this year, please deny the TUCP as proposed and instead require DWR and Reclamation to curtail deliveries to all contractors except deliveries for health and human safety and for wildlife refuge as a condition for approval of any TUCP in 2022. Thank you for considering these comments and for your time today. Thank you for your comments. Next is Tim Strochane with Restore the Delta. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Diadamo and members of the State Water Board. I'm Tim Strochane, Policy Analyst with Restore the Delta. My remarks are about the draft reconsideration order. First, the draft order as written is unacceptable. We incorporate comments of NRDC, the Bay Institute, San Francisco Baykeeper and Defenders of Wildlife into our remarks on the draft reconsideration order. We agree that the Water Board's order states conclusions that are not based on actual findings contained in the order. Um, we ask that you align the conclusions with the findings that NRDC et al. Have, have identified to have a morally just and ecologically reasonable draft order before adopting it. Second, on page 40 in the draft order, the board defined legal users of water to justify privileging of propertied water users over non-propertied. Uh, we don't believe such a de definition can be found in the California Water Code. Uh, more importantly, the, the order's authors picked this nit to avoid addressing a much larger issue we were raising which is that the, we, we want to know why do petitioners DWR and the Bureau and the Water Board narrowly privilege potential harms or injuries primarily to water property to water right holders rather than a, a more inclusive reading that would embrace concerns of Delta environmental justice and other communities given numerous water quality 
concerns rife with the TUCP. The order's argument on this point implicitly and improperly rejects such concerns about the TUCP. The board must do better. The board has long used the, the unique water rights of the CVP and SWP to implement water quality objectives in both temporary urgency change petitions as well as D1641 and the Bay Delta plan. Because of the dual role of these particular water rights in Delta affairs, it is logical and reasonable that the phrase legal users of water include both property and non property water users and their protection from harms stemming from this type of change petition. This was done during the water fix proceeding. Board rejection of this understanding does not make the realities of waiving water quality objectives go away. Realities like spreading harmful algal blooms, near extinction of native fish, and increased delta salinity. By defining away non property beneficial users of water like environmental justice communities, your recent racial diversity, equity, and inclusion resolution becomes empty words when the board addresses water rights and the big projects. Please revise your draft re reconsideration order to align your conclusions with the facts the order describes. Please also include non-property legal beneficial users of water in your accounting of in injuries and harms. Don't erase them. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today. Thank you, Mr. Strosane. Next is William Martin with the Sierra Club. I note, though, that he signed up only as needed. Um, I'm here. There you uh, are. I, I, do, I do want to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, I was hoping not to speak, but uh, I'm going to uh, because of my concerns. Uh, my name is Bill Martin. I'm a San Francisco resident. I'm the co-chair of the Sierra Club California Water Committee. I've spoken before this board on several occasions. Today, I am speaking as a concerned citizen, as a recreational kayaker and fisherman, and as someone who knows the Delta well from my many years of visiting and enjoying this unique and wonderful place. I strongly oppose the granting temporary relief from Delta flow standards as proposed by DWR and the Bureau of Reclamation. I also oppose the continuation of the rock barrier at the conjunction of False River and the San Joaquin River in the Delta. Healthy Delta outflows remain one of the few tools to ensure that adequate flows continue through the Bay Delta estuary. I am very concerned that reduction in flows will have significantly negative effects throughout the entire estuary, including San Francisco Bay. The Delta smelt is already functionally extinct in the wild. All other aquatic creatures have suffered huge declines in their populations, certainly including endangered runs of Chinook stem. How many more of our fellow creatures are we going to kill off because of our short-sighted over-diversions of Delta flows? How many more harmful algal blooms will we allow to endanger wildlife, humans, and their pets? How many more times are we going to grant these types of special requests to agencies which have shown by their past behavior that they do not deserve such special consideration? I am especially upset that the Bureau of Reclamation is involved in this request. In early 2021, I spoke before this board about temperature management of the Sacramento River. My point then is the same as it is now. The Bureau is not a reliable partner in protecting California's ecosystem. Their diversion permits should be denied until they show they are true stewards of our waters. Thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to speak. I hope that you will uh, uh, continue to examine these, uh, these requests with a extremely skeptical eye. I'm done. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Martin. Next is uh, Chris Schutz. Good morning, or yes, good, good afternoon now, um, uh, Chip, Vice Chair Diadamo and members of the board. I'm Chris Schutz with the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance, or CSPA. I will briefly comment first on the proposed TUCP for 2022, and second on the draft order on reconsideration. CSPA and allied groups will submit written comments on both. The only good thing about this TUCP is that the board has the opportunity to deny it now and order DWR and reclamation 
to evaluate and model operations for water year 2022 that will meet Delta and Sacramento River standards uh, with low salmon mortality and protect public trust. In short, that is what you must do. As we heard this morning, the projects dug a deep hole in their reservoirs in 2021. They did this at the expense of fisheries and other in-stream resources and values. The TUCP asks the board to double down on 2021 on the presumption that CVP and SWP operations will prioritize deliveries to senior agricultural diverters over protections of the public trust. That is wrong, it needs to stop. Refilling reservoirs is important. There is no basis, however, for gaining a tiny increment of advantage in reservoir refill by shorting delta outflow and water quality. Deliveries to SWP and CVP contractors, including senior contractors, must be limited to volumes consistent with protections of delta and in river, river resources. Turning now to the draft order on reconsideration. The board's actions in approving the 2021 TUCP and the Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan were unlawful. There is no sense in which they were reasonable. The, effort, the effects to fish were not only unreasonable, they were outrageous. There is an overriding sense by the projects and the board that the only way to protect public trust resources is to deprive other public trust resources. That paradigm needs to stop. Lack of objections from fisheries agencies does not justify the board's actions in 2021 or during previous drafts. The board has an independent responsibility in law to make its own independent analyses of the effect of its actions. The TUCP and the Sac River temp Temperature Management Plan did not achieve even the meager targets they set for themselves. Most of the water supposedly conserved in Shasta Reservoir due to the TUCP was subsequently transferred. That wasn't conservation. It was reoperation of deliveries by a couple of months. Even the modified Delta water quality standards were not met. The end of September storage target for Shasta Reservoir was 175,000 acre feet short. Egg to fry survival of winter run salmon in 2021 was disastrously low. Conditions for fall run were also very bad with no results as yet unknown. The draft order does not explain how the board balanced resources and needs. It does not explain the process by which it weighed whether effects to fish and wildlife were reasonable or whether use of water was unreasonable. It simply affirms an answer. Since the draft order says that what is reasonable varies, the board needs to explain just what would have been the tipping points in this case. The board should also explain what it means in practice for its orders to prohibit take of listed species. And the board needs to stop acceptance of one year snapshots in the consideration of unreasonable effects to fish and wildlife. It is dealing with decades of degradation with particularly grave in impacts in drier sequences. The comparison of the short term incremental impacts of actions against a degraded baseline does not capture whether effects of an action on fish are unreasonable. DWR tells you that hydrology is not static, but the projects and the draft order evaluate the conditions of fish and wildlife as though they were static. The board needs a new paradigm, it needs to hold the projects accountable for risky operations in previous years. It should start by evaluating options for responsible operation of the state water project and the Central Valley Project in 2022, and it should hold the projects to what it finds. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Schutz. Next is Elizabeth Doherty with Holy H2O. Ms. Townsend, do we have Ms. Doherty? Tried a couple of times, Vice Chair Diodamo, to offer her the opportunity to unmute. I also got an email from her saying that she would be checking off, but she's still on the platform. So she might have just left her phone at the time. So we can just go to the next person. Okay. 
We'll come back to Ms. Doherty if she is able to join. Uh, next is David Guy, Northern California Water Association. He actually is not on the platform as well. So it would be Dante Nomelini. Nomelini, I'm sorry. Nomelini, yes. Mr. Nomelini. We've given Miss. There I'm we go. Here. Can you hear me? There we go. Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Namalini. You know, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, I'm the secret uh, manager and attorney for the Central Delta Water Agency. Uh, I've been active, as many of you know, for many, many years. Uh, what is going on with the temporary urgency change and the uh, approval? of portions of the previous temporary urgency change is in my opinion, directly contrary to law and inappropriate in terms of the public interest. The uh, critical factor here is that the actions of the board are suspending uh, water code 13247, which requires that the agencies of the state uh, have to support the water quality objectives in D16 that are incorporated in D1641. And what's happening here is that it only adds to a bias that I've seen over the years in favor of exports versus the needs within the watersheds. And the needs within the watershed we're supposed to take priority over any project exports. And in fact, the projects were required to provide salinity control as a primary objective for the right to divert surplus water from Northern California into the Valley in Southern California. Now, what has occurred here is the pattern and practice of using emergency authority to supersede uh, the result of hundreds of hours to develop the water quality objectives and the standards that are now applicable to the project. So it's absolutely, in our opinion, wrong to continue that same practice and to recognize the validity of it. If you look at the, I have a PowerPoint, let's go to a page in here that shows what Water Code 13247 said. So if we can flip through the, keep going. The order of my slides is not exactly what I intended. Keep going. All right. It should be, keep, maybe it's one more. Go ahead. It should just be, a, okay. This code section says that only if there's a statutory authorization for deviation from the requirements of this statute that says all state offices, departments, and boards in carrying out activities which may affect water quality shall comply with water quality control plans approved or adopted by the state board. And somebody, I think it must be a lawyer within the State Water Resource and Control Board. And I assume the State Water Resource Control Board greatly influences the actions of the governor in this regard, has decided to circumvent the statutory protections for the Delta and the watersheds of origin, including the fish and wildlife needs by being, uh, I think, abusing the emergency power of the government to supersede the law and court decisions that have guided us in terms of making sure that the areas of origin, including the Delta, have priority over export. Now, if we go back on the slide, a couple of slides, go back to the beginning. Keep going, go all the way back. The projects themselves 
were planned. Let's stop right there. Let's go back to that graph, hydro, the graph of the hydrology. This is the hydrology that governed the planning for the CVP and SWP. And it focused in on the drought, which is 20, 1928, uh, 29 through 34, and analyzed what the capability was of the Central Valley or the Delta watershed to provide water that could be exported to the Valley in Southern California. And they concluded that there was a shortage of 8 million acre feet, even without exports, and that that shortage would be made up from groundwater for local demand and the environmental purposes, which at that time were not uh, visualized to be as great as they are today. But the plan was to go to the North Coast. Let's go to the next slide. One more. Mr. Namalini, yeah. um, we're, we're past time, but I know that you, you lost a little bit of time in sorting through finding the right slide. So uh, I'll give you another right, minute. Let me hit this but one. We'll need to wrap up. The plan of the project was to develop 5 million acre feet from North Coast watershed of California to supplement what is in the Delta and needed to meet not only their contractual obligations, but the anticipated growth and development within the watershed. Now that wasn't done. That 5 million acre feet alone, which is not the total shortage that I think existed, means that there's a, over a million 600,000 acres of desert and arid land that has no water supply. So this crisis is huge. And it's up to the board to kind of straighten it out. We can't just look at 2022. We've got to look further for future dry years. Anyway, uh, we will give written comments. I appreciate the short time to hit this point, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, the next speaker is Brent Baker with the Central Delta Water Agency. Thank you, Vice Chair and uh, board members for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I'll keep it short uh, as my predecessor has covered most of the bases, what he provided there in his PowerPoint and uh, what we'll provide on Friday with, in our written comments should fill in the gaps. I just had a few points I wanted to hit and a uh, couple questions I had about some of the numbers and figures that have been thrown out today. <clears throat> I, on behalf of Central Delta Water Agency, have submitted comments on temporary transfers the past a uh, few years and, and plan to submit more. Um, we do have a, an outstanding issue with the way that uh, water code section uh, 1725 is being implemented in a particular piecemeal uh, practice um, that, that uh, looks at these, these transfers in an isolated fashion. And so the accounting of those, those volumes of water have always remained mysterious to us. And, and I just was hoping that we might shed some light on it here. Uh, furthermore, our, our, my main issue is with um, the assertion that was, I, I believe, uh, put out earlier that, that these temporary transfers only have a positive impact on flows in the Delta. And there's, there's no detrimental impacts to these as they're adding water to the system, although there are increased amounts of export pumping to move that water. So um, I just really wanted to focus in on uh, three figures that were thrown out. Um, apparently, there was a 800,000 acre foot discrepancy that occurred between the end of May and June and um, with, with uh, um, DWR's um, um, uh, forecast. And then uh, also reference was that there was a 238 acre or 1,000 acre foot benefit to the TUCP. And I'm curious to know where that figure or how those figures uh, um, reckon with the amount of water that was transferred through the Delta this year annually, uh, this under, under temporary transfers and otherwise. So I'm just curious to know how much water was moved in addition to, or if that 238 captures the temporary transfers that went through the Delta um, as well. So, um, 
Thank you. I'll leave it there for right now. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Uh, Roger Mammon. So I note that uh, that was just if necessary. Is he on the platform, Ms. Townsend? Yes, he is. I've just, he. Okay, there we go. There you go. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Vice Chair and Board Members. My name is Roger Mammon. I live in the city of Oakley in the West Delta. I'm the president of the West Delta chapter, the California Striped Bass Association. I've spoken before this board before, before the Delta Stewardship Council, Fish and Game Commission, about the Delta, the health, health status of the fisheries. And so far, none of it's done any good. Our Delta is a unique ecosystem. It is the largest inverted Delta in the world. There's only one other inverted Delta and that's a small one in Portugal, which is being suffering from sedimentation and would probably disappear soon. Because it's an, an inverted Delta, it created a wealth of life, fish, game, it was, it's a wonderful ecosystem and it needs to be protected. We can't let our Delta, our invented, inverted Delta, the largest in the world, silt up because of the lack of flows. We are still in a drought and there was some talk about the harmful algae blooms. Well, there was another one that wasn't mentioned and that was in Big Break Regional Park here in the city of Oakley. I was listening to uh, DWR Representative Hartman talk about the algae blooms and the other people talking about the flows in the Delta. And there's a lot of time and money and expense going on studying all this stuff. And it seems to me that the conclusion after their testimony would be to remove the Falls River barrier and let natural flows go through the Delta and any salinity that goes into the South Delta, you know, they just have to restrict the amount of pumping that goes in there. But we can't continue to drain the Delta. It'll die. And it's been dying for decades now. I'm not going to go into the fisheries of the 2%, but uh, I also looked at the mission statement of the Department of water resources, and that's to preserve, enhance, and restore the quality of California's water resources and drinking water for the protection of the environment, public health, and all beneficial uses, and to ensure proper water resource allocation and efficient use for the benefit of present and future generations. And I oppose the, the TUP and I hope that you live up to your mission statement. Thanks very much. Thank you for your comments. Okay, at this point, we're going to um, break for lunch unless, but I do wanna check with Ms. Townsend to see if there was any urgent need for uh, one of the speakers. Uh, I have not heard any. Okay. I have not received any emails either, so. Okay, great. All right, so we'll break uh, for lunch and return um, promptly at 1.30.
lining everybody up, but we will be. Um,
All right, welcome back everyone. Um, we will resume with public comment and I'm looking for the speaker list on, on what I have. It looks like it might be a Karen Campbell, but I wanna double check with Ms. That Townsend. is correct, Chair, okay. Vice Chair. All right, Karen Campbell. There she is. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Karen Campbell, and I want to thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present today. I am a registered nurse living in Fresno. Um, I have read and listened to a lot, and I appreciate all the presentations today very much. Um, and I also know something about the importance of water and food for all living beings. I am a nature lover and very much love to preserve or our effort to preserve the Delta ecosystem and the water quality. Um, so, um, I am losing my way here, sorry. As a nature lover, I'm very concerned about the state of our of the ecosystem and especially our beautiful Delta and its water quality. And this is what makes me ask a question that has concerned me for a very long time. Um, we have many um, communities around the Delta and from what I have read and seen, there, um, there's a lot of treatment plants, or I should say sewage treatment plants that are, I'm gonna say aging, uh, which has resulted in increased um, uh, dumping, uh, un unwanted or un inadvertent, I think, of um, sewage, whether um, treated or partially treated into the water. Um, and I know that that goes on for, I'm not saying that it's, you know, all the time, but um, I for years now this has happened. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. I think we just had um, a little mishap there with another microphone, but go ahead. Okay, so these sewage spills, um, there is a report that can be um, accessed on, um, I see one in front of me here for January 1st, 2021. I'm not technically, not very good technically, so I can't put it in front of you, but um, it shows quite a few um, uh, spills um, with marks, and there's a lot of them um, in and around the Delta. I know that repairing these systems would cost a lot. I don't even know how much, but probably in the billions, if not more. I know that the federal infrastructure bill, meaning the federal infrastructure bill, has devoted money to water quality. And also that California has a, um, an excess in our um, budget. And I'm concerned that we're not using all the tools in our toolbox to improve the Delta water quality. Um, we talk about the flow of water through there, and that is important. We've talked about a lot of things today, and I appreciate all the presentations. But I would like to just say that as a nurse, imagine if I had a chronic condition, say diabetes, and had long-term potential lethal implications with it, which it does. Imagine if my physician gave me a treatment plan that only gave me one solution, and that was to give me an order for insulin, but no instruction on limiting sugar intake. So when my sugar increased, he just gave me more insulin. And that went on for 10 years, 20 years. I probably would be dead probably before then. Um, so I just would like to ask the board to back off and try to look at more than just one modality in helping these fish to survive. It's a very important one. But there's 
there's some other things that could be looked at since we do care about these fish. Um, uh, so then the, the, the second point I wanted to point out is uh, when considering users, water users here in California, I would like if the board could consider more than just the um, environment because water users include water quality for fish, water for communities and health and safety, which was mentioned, industrial use, agricultural use, groundwater recharge, fisheries. And so this is the big picture. And I know you have a lot to consider and I hear all the pressures that are on you guys. Um, it's a big job, but um, I, I, I sort of think of it as a family and um, what would happen if our, I, I like to give pictures. I know that this is not very technical and I know all of these presentations have been very technical, but um, if I could give a picture, it would be like, um, uh, imagine a family that had uh, this same number of children and most of the, and then had maybe loss of uh, job or something. So limited resources of one kind or another and had to temporarily uh, cut back on expenses. If, um, if all the all the house supplies or food or whatever was poured out on one child and the others were neglected, um, that's sort of what I almost feel like this is happening. And so um, I'm just putting that as my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for uh, your participation. Um, we are focused um, on today's uh, workshop on reconsideration of a temporary urgency change petition and also um, uh, from, uh, from last year and then also potentially one going forward for this year. Because you've raised some um, you know, general concerns, I just wanna take this opportunity um, maybe to encourage you to um, explore our website because there might be based on your interest, a couple of other areas that you might wanna explore. One would be the update of the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan. Uh, there's lots of information there. And then additionally, maybe uh, you would wanna take a look at the Central Valley uh, Regional Water Quality Control Board's website to look for potential opportunities on specific um, plants that might be up for uh, renewal for their permit. Um, and then lastly, you mentioned infrastructure. Um, we are the fortunate recipient of um, quite a bit of additional funding and we are going to be holding a workshop. I'm not recalling the date, but if you look at our website, uh, there'll be uh, some information there when the notice comes out um, so that we can obtain uh, public comment on how to go forward with um, uh, the infrastructure funding that we've received. So thank you again for your comments, really appreciate it. Um, next, we have um, Natalia Bar Barraza from the Northern California Water Association. Hello. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, Vice Chair and Board Members. I'm Natalia Barraza, and I'm a Water Climate Intern with Restore the Delta. I'm speaking here today to urge you to rethink your plan for water, water quality standards for the Delta. The temporary urgent change petition is not an acceptable order, order to manage in the next upcoming months. Not only will this barrier be initially said to be removed, was initially said to be removed at the end of November, but it also interrupts interrupts fish migration. Through these dangerous decisions, multiple problems will occur that will damage our ecosystems, our water, and the livelihoods of hundreds of disadvantaged community members that depend on it. This barrier will destroy the freshwater flows that are needed for the largest estuary in the west coast of the Americas. Through past access water exports and lack of incoming flows, this estuary has been damaged for all its beneficial water uses for decades. The answer to our water management distress is, to no, is not to gut D1641 water quality standards for the Delta each and every year that we experience drought. The temporary urgent, urgent change position states that the Department of Water Resources and Reclamation requested changes to flow dependent water quality requirements in response to two consecutive 
two consecutive years of dry conditions and low rainfall in order to preserve water and storage and project reservoirs to meet other project ab obligations and improve reservoir storage conditions going into next year. These changes are not to reduce the mandatory outflow levels of the Delta. Through the unpreparedness in handling two consecutive dry years, important decisions need to be made, but reducing flows is not the solution. As a part of a disadvantaged community, I have seen the harm of insufficient flows that happen to our estuary and to our animals. You have heard many complaints and you will continue hearing more because this is not the proper way to resolve water quality issues. By reducing the Delta outflow and installation of the 2021 emergency drought salinity barrier would have unreasonable effects on fish and wildlife and the ecosystem by reducing Delta inflows and outflows. This will create problems that we're very familiar with, an increase of air pollution from harmful algal blooms as a public health problem, an expanded abundance of non-native submerged aquatic vegetation, vegeta sorry, vegetation, and an increased extinction risk for long fin smell and Delta smell. Fresno and all cities in California discharge wastewater into our waterways, and but we support the monitor, monitoring of it. The existing conditions are all a result of poor water management decisions prior to and during the drought, and that impacts to fish and wildlife are incurred due to the failure of Department of Water Resources and Reclamation to plan and drought for drought periods. It's time to save the San Francisco Bay Delta estuary for the people of California. Protecting Delta water quality must become a priority for the board because this is about protecting our disadvantaged community, our industries and the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barraza. And I apologize for uh, saying that you're with uh, Northern California Water Association uh, and not restore the Delta. So sorry about that. Um, next is Ben Eichenberg um, with San Francisco Baykeeper. Good afternoon. Thank you, Vice Chair Diodamo. Um, as you said, my name is Ben Eichenberg. I'm a staff attorney with San Francisco Baykeeper. Um, and together with our more than uh, approximately 5,000 members and supporters who live and recreate in and around the San Francisco Bay area, um, our mission is to defend San Francisco Bay from the biggest threats and to hold polluters and government agencies accountable to create healthy communities and to help wildlife thrive. Um, well, we've identified as one of the biggest threats to the Bay, the lack of enforceable science-based minimum flow regimes and temperature requirements for the production of, for the protection of, of public trust values uh, and identified beneficial uses for all major Central Valley River tributaries to the San Francisco estuary. The repeated temporary urgency change petitions have been a major reason why, why this is such a big threat. Um, we therefore urge the board to reject as currently proposed First, the board staff's draft order regarding the petition to reconsider the executive, executive director's 2021 approval of temporary urgency changes to the Delta water quality objectives. Second, the executive director's approval of the 2021 final Sacramento River temperature management plan. And finally, third, reclamation and DWR's proposed temporary urgency changes to the Delta water quality objectives in 2022. The board is required by its mission, uh, by the Clean Water Act, by its legislative mandate, and under the California Constitution to make and enforce science-based rules protecting public trust resources in California, and must therefore impose additional substantive terms and conditions on the water rights of the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project in order to ensure that project operations do not cause unreasonable harm to fish and wildlife or irreparable damage to the public trust. The Bay Delta watershed Post six endangered fish species, which according to the board and to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife are not adequately protected by existing water quality standards. These species are bellwethers that indicate the board's other public trust and beneficial use obligations are also not being met. That, that means that other species held in trust by the board are also declining precipitously. And that further means that communities in the Delta are routinely subjected to health risks from toxic algae blooms that thrive when river flows are low. Uh, by repeatedly failing to enforce its own water quality objectives, particularly those designed for dry and critically dry years, the board is failing in its obligations. Despite this clear evidence of the need for improved water quality standards, the board has failed to update and implement those standards for the Bay Delta, a process that began all the way back in 2008. Meanwhile, 
in four of the last eight years, the board approved temporary urgency change petitions that allow state and federal water projects to violate Bay Delta water quality standards, and it may do so again in 2022. Exacerbating this mockery of its own regulations and duties, the board has ignored reclamation and DWR's repeated violations of water quality standards and obligations under D1641. Similarly, the board routinely rubber stamps reclamation Sacramento River temperature management plans required under order 90-5. It did so again last year, even though temperature related mortality was projected to decimate endangered species. And even though temperature modeling revealed that restricting water deliveries under reclamation's control would provide substantial relief to those species. The board has blamed drought for its pattern and practice of waiving or ignoring water quality requirements that were designed specifically for drought. The board continues to find that its TUC orders provide reasonable protection for fish and wildlife. But as a result of the board's failures, the Bay Delta's native fish are now closer to extinction than they have ever been. This is not reasonable by any definition and balancing of beneficial uses cannot result in extinction and public health impacts, especially when the board continues to ignore obvious alternatives, including curtailing water deliveries to senior settlement and exchange contractors. Therefore, before considering TUCPs or other modifications, we call on the board to require DWR and reclamation to curtail water deliveries, water diversions, and water allocations to all CVP and SWP contractors, including settlement and exchange contractors, except for water diversions necessary for human health and safety and for wildlife refuges. Finally, it is unlawful and insufficient for the board to rely on the interim operations plan proposed by the state. This plan focuses on ESA listed species only. The board has a broader legal mandate to protect fish and wildlife, specifically including the salmon fishery, estuarine habitat, and water quality. Analyses by my colleague, Dr. Jonathan Rosenfield, which we plan to submit to the board, demonstrate that the IOP fails to provide adequate protection even for endangered species, much, le much less for other beneficial uses. Therefore, the board must revise the proposed conditions in the draft order to provide minimally adequate protections for fish and wildlife if 2222 is dry or critically dry. Thank you for considering our comments. Thank you. Next is uh, Deirdre Desjardins with the California Water Research. Hello, um, this is Deirdre Desjardins with uh, California Water Research. Um, and I wanted to thank the board um, for their consideration of this um, very difficult issue of uh, management of the system for drought. Um, I'm a physicist with a research background in nonlinear dynamical systems and computational modeling. I've advocated for better management of the State Water Project and Central Valley Project for climate change for the past decade. Um, Eris Georgiakakos is an internationally known expert in multi-reservoir system operations who did a decade of research on the State Water Project and Central Valley Project. In 2011, he wrote that an unintended consequence of the way reservoir operation plans and policies have historically evolved is that it discourages the use of key science advances related to hydroclimactic forecasting, multi-reservoir optimization, uncertainty characterization, and integrated water resources management. Yeah, true adaptive water resources management relies critically on such methods. While you heard a lot of information about hydrologic forecasting, you did not get information about the system operational forecasts. And the simple fact is the State Water Project and Central Valley Project system operators are still using very simple methods. In 2016, they testified they're using Excel spreadsheets for system operations. And that in the beginning of the water year, they do operation forecasts for 50% hydrology and 90% hydrology. We know the State Water Project and Central Valley Project system operators are doing these operational forecasts and that they're being shared with the Central Valley Project contractors 
because Westland's Waters District reported at their 2021, uh, 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 the December 21st board meeting, a forecast of getting a five to 15% allocation in 2022 under the 50% exceedance hydrology. I wanted to second the request by Thad Bettner that the board mandate public disclosure of the forecasts and the models referred to in the temporary urgency change petition. This is essential, not only for a fair board process, but also for improvement of forecasts and model. Furthermore, I wanted to point out that the board cannot rely on the coordinated operations agreement to meet water quality control plan requirements. 2018 amendment number one to the coordinated operations agreement states in part, in a dry or critical year, following two dry or critical years, the United States and the state will meet to discuss additional changes to the percentage sharing of responsibility to meet in basin use. The projects have not indicated that they've met and they have not indicated an agreement on sharing responsibilities for meeting the responsibilities for in meeting in basin needs if 2022 is a third dry or critically dry year. Therefore, there is insufficient evidence before the board at this point of a plan for meeting the water quality control plan requirements, even with the operations proposed under the TUCP. And I did wanna remind the board that in decision 990, granting the permits for the Central Valley project, the board did reserve jurisdiction to determine coordinated terms and conditions of the Central Valley project and state water project. This year, the board needs to exercise that jurisdiction by asking for the forecasts and modeling the proposed operations and reviewing those forecasts and modeling. While there's still uncertainty about future hydrology, there is sufficient information to do a forecast for a period of three to six months. And quite frankly, this whole thing about we're switching from short-term models to long-term models does not seem credible given Westland's Water District report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jardin. Next is Mike Giles. Mr. Giles. I'll move on, uh, Ms. Townsend. Yes, I have um, asked for him to unmute and oh. at this point he hasn't. So, but I do have someone who we need to, um, who has to, another appointment that needs to get to and that would be Catherine Parilla. Okay. Okay, Ms. I'm Perilla. Go ahead and ask her to unmute. Okay. Good Hello. afternoon, Ms. Um, Perilla. Good morning, or sorry, good afternoon, Chair Escobar and board members. Um, my name is Catherine Perilla. I am a climate water advocate for Restore the Delta. And in addition to that, I am also a full time student at Humboldt State, but I'm originally from Stockton. I have watched the Delta deteriorate since I was a really young kid. Um, the collapse of the estuary not only impacts my hometown, but the new community in which I live and work, um, Humboldt County, as Northern California tribes are as dependent on healthy Delta as our Stockton's communities. It is 2022 and the same management plan is being proposed that I have seen nearly every year of my life. The Delta and its surrounding communities will be surrounded by unsafe water that do not meet D1641 standards, a standard that is not even rigorous enough to protect the estuary, fisheries or people, and certain industrial agricultural districts skate free from making shared water sacrifices. I have no memory or consciousness as a young child of when the State Water Resources Control Board ruled fully and without hesitancy to protect the estuary or our community. I have seen a number of decisions that, I have, that have favored industrial growers, an elite group of Californians who grow export crops. 
I have seen dead fish in our waterways. I have smelled the odor of green algae. I have breathed in the bacteria and pollution that aggravated my childhood asthma. I have run on levees surrounding dirty, stagnant water. And these are the sacrifices that I have been expected to live with. So I have a question and that is, were the sacrifices of the privileged water districts that grow export crops for profit during these permanently dry times? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, well, I'll check again on uh, Mike Giles. I will check one more time here. It doesn't look like um, okay. he is. So the next one would be Mr. John McManus. Mr. McManus, Golden State Salmon Association. May be able to hear me. You may yes. be able to see me. Hello. Hi. Um, good presentations today. Uh, appreciated that. Uh, one thing I missed though was we didn't hear anything from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife or the National Marine Fisheries Service on how things worked out for fish last summer. That seems germane to uh, approval of the 2021 TUCP. And I think could actually be informative as well for the current uh, petition in front of you. Um, at the Golden State Salmon Association, we echo the comments of many that have come before, including Tim Schroestein and um, Doug Obegee and others. We think that uh, it would be inappropriate to grant the current TUC, TUCP without uh, putting additional conditions on it. I would just like to add something about what happened to the fish last year. Uh, we now know that very few survived, very few of the winter run. The temperature management plan was inadequate, and that's now well documented. Um, the document put out by the state earlier today showed that there was an estimated 31 million eggs from winter run that were available to spawn. I mean, we had a good return last year in the upper river. It's really tragic that after years of trying to rebuild this run, we've taken such a hit. 31 million eggs and out of that, the state expects we'll see a mere 125,000 baby winter run make it as far as the Delta. Uh, many more of them will die uh, between the Delta and the Golden Gate Bridge. So they're taking a real heavy hit. And I would just like to also comment on another aspect of temperature that occurred this past year. In addition to wiping out the winter run, we saw that water temperatures coming out of Shasta and Keswick were lethally high solidly through the months of September, October, and November. And what it means to us is that the fall run fish, which we rely on, uh, were badly damaged as well. We, we won't know for months how many we lost, but it very, could, it very well could be that we lost something similar to the losses experienced by the winter run. Um, one other uh, point I'd like to make relative to the TUCP that's before you now is um, we have to keep in mind that the river functions as a conveyor belt for transporting juvenile salmon out to the ocean. And when TUCPs are granted that don't uh, reduce diversions to some of the agricultural users in the Sacramento Valley, what we see is the conveyor belt is functionally cut and the juvenile salmon aren't gonna make it out to the ocean. So um, this is something I would like the state board to keep in mind as you consider um, the request in front of you. And basically, you know, you've heard from many people saying that the, the pain should be shared all around and a little bit more fairly. And at the end of the day, you've also heard from many speakers who point out that there are social justice issues occurring here or put more, put a little differently, there are social injustices going on here with uh, major groups being harmed while others um, aren't sharing the pain in exactly the same way. A, a final point, I, I don't think anybody has a problem with providing water for human health and safety. I think you've heard that from virtually every speaker today. I would like to echo the Golden State Salmon Association agrees with that point, human health and safety first. But the question before you really is how you deal with what happens next. I'll stop there and thanks for taking my comment. Thank you for your comments. Next is Regina Chitizola with Save California Salmon. 
Hello. Hello. Um, thank you for having me today. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little distracted because it got so late in the afternoon. Um, but hopefully I can get my notes in order here. Um, but I just wanted to um, say to the board that I feel like the Bureau of Reclamation has shown their um, inability to actually meet terms and conditions of their water rights um, and their temperature water management plan. And so therefore I think, um, going along with a, temp a temporary urgency change petition is a very bad idea because um, it seems to me like the Bureau is not going to use that extra water to make sure that the reservoirs fill up. They're going to make, they're going to use it to give contract deliveries to farmers that are not using water in a way that's consistent with drought and climate change. And it's a grave injustice. Um, you know, having the majority of the fish die in the Sacramento this year um, is really going to impact fishermen. It's really going to impact tribes. It's already impacting toxic algae blooms and water quality. Um, I live in the Klamath River um, myself, and so I know directly what the um, in, what the connection is between flows and toxic algae and what happens when you start getting carryover toxic algae, which sounds like is what's happening now in the Delta. And it really depletes water quality. And the only way to deal with these water quality issues is with flow, unfortunately. Um, so I also wanted to mention that the Bureau of Reclamation did violate um, its temperature management plan a lot this year. And that led to a lot of fish dying. Um, and also that I feel like even the state even be continuing to contemplate, um, continuing to make decisions based on the Trump water plan instead of making decisions based on the critical need. One for carryover storage in the reservoir is yes, but also for water quality. Like I said, we can't continue to have these carryover water quality impacts into the Delta and um, continuing to just rubber stamp violating the law is going to lead to that. And it's gonna start impacting people's drinking water supplies along with the toxic algae conditions. Um, so I urge you to please not approve this plan. And I am sorry that I have so much background noise. I didn't realize that this meeting was gonna go quite so late. Um, and please have a good day. I tried to be quick. Thank you, you too, have a good day. Um, next is Barry Nelson, Golden State Salmon Association. Thank you, uh, uh, Vice Chair Didamo. Um, Didamo, Barry Nelson with Golden State Salmon Association. I'm going to speak uh, briefly regarding both TUCPs and temperature control. Both of those issues are critical, the health of salmon runs and survival of the fishing industry. Um, and we'll have written comments uh, uh, submitted by the end of the week. Um, uh, I, 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 I urge you to recall the concerns that you heard from our community and from fish agencies uh, regarding the potential impacts of Shasta Dam and the TUCPs. As a number of speakers have said, the uh, CDFW has now released those survival numbers. And as John McManus and others said, um, a winter run survival, that is just egg to fry, is 2.5% over 97% of those juvenile uh, winter run eggs were killed before they hatched or, or, uh, or, or, or became juveniles moving downstream. That's a repeat of 2014, 2015, and 2020. And perhaps, uh, all the data is not in yet, but perhaps the worst of all of those years. Uh, the fall run numbers, as John McManus says, are likely to be similar, but they're not in yet. Um, but it gets worse. CDFW also estimated expected survival downstream. And if you do the math, what it suggests is that CDFW projects that less than four tenths of 1% of endangered winter run eggs are expected to hatch, survive to the juvenile stage and make it to the Delta. It's important for two reasons. First, with regard to temperature management plans, um, the fisheries agencies predicted this disaster. Frankly, they have been predicting this disaster tragically accurately for year after year after year, and the board has not still acted to require adequate temperature protection. This is the fourth near complete destruction of Sacramento <coughs> River um, winter run in eight years. It is not sustainable. The board can't let that happen again. 
And it's critical that the board send a very clear message as soon as possible to the Bureau um, so that they can plan responsibly for operations this year. Second, um, with regard to TUCPs, um, as I mentioned, CDFW anticipates that four tenths of 1% of winter run eggs will survive to the Delta. Then they must survive, for the, survive through the Delta. And the Delta standards that are designed to protect those fish are the very standards that Bureau and DWR are asking you to relax. The, what that means is that Bureau and DWR are planning to worsen the salmon disaster we've already seen this spawning season. Were the state board to approve that request, it would signal that the board accepts the repeated near total loss of Sacramento River winter run, perhaps fall run, as acceptable. Make no percent by mistake. This is between the combination of temperature control problems and TUCPs. We're seeing a plan for extinction being implemented, whether it's conscious or unconscious. The solution is clear. On the one hand, adequate temperature control, the board needs to order adequate carryover storage and temperature control and full transparency of models and so forth, even if um, providing that temperature control requires reductions to senior users. That, that is a bullet. It is time for the board to bite. Second, um, any TUCP um, must be restricted um, um, to being considered only if water is not physically available, as John McMahon McManus mentioned a moment ago. Um, that means requiring DWR and the Bureau to reduce deliveries and deliveries um, other than the public health and safety um, uh, uh, deliveries that John McManus mentioned, including Sacramento River Settlement Contractors, San Joaquin Exchange Contractors, Feather River Contractors for DWR. That's a, that's a painful outcome, um, but it is a pain that many water users are, uh, are um, experiencing. And frankly, it's one that we believe is required by the law. I I'd like to close with a request. Uh, last time I spoke with you, I recommended that during Bay Delta hearings, um, issues that the board receive regular briefings about the status of natural resources. I'd like to repeat that request in the context of TUCPs and, um, and temperature management. I'd like to, to thank the staff for their work, um, thank the folks at DWR for their briefing on hydrology, uh, and also for the briefing on harmful algae blooms, um, uh, and, and thank the staff for um, uh, announcing a workshop in March on salmon impacts. But it is critical that when the board is considering temperature management and when the board is considering TUCPs, the board simultaneously receives detailed briefings on the status of the species that are at issue here. Not just harmful algae blooms, as important as they are, and we strongly support those issues in that briefing. Um, it's critical that the board receive timely simultaneous briefings on these issues, because as a few other speakers have mentioned, um, the resources we're talking about here are in truly catastrophic shape. And frankly, that issue hasn't received enough attention in this debate, um, in particularly in terms of briefings for the board from staff, from C also, as John Mc McManus mentioned, from CDFW, from National Marine Fisheries Service. So I urge you to make sure that the briefings at future Bay Delta hearings, workshops, um, um, TUCP discussions, temperature discussions, um, they don't sideline the status of the resources. Uh, they need to be front and center. Thanks very much. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Nelson. Next, uh, Zuni Thompson with Restore the Delta. Hello. Hi. Um, good afternoon, and um, thank you, board, for your time today. My name is actually. Sorry, you're freezing, and it sounds like I've mispronounced your name. Maybe if you take off your video, that might help. <laughs> Looks like we may have lost Mr. Thompson. No, but it looks like we also have Mike Giles back yeah. on. <laughs> okay, Mr. Thompson, if you can hear us, we'll just keep you in queue and we're, we're gonna take um, someone who was in queue earlier that wasn't able to join. So Mr. Giles, and then we'll go back to Mr. Thompson. 
Yes, hello. Hi. Hello. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, yes. Um, I, I just want you to know that I really appreciate your uh, letting us speak here and everything. Uh, so much is going on. But um, I, I just want you to know that, uh, at least from the point of view of a lot of us out here, the um, uh, the the business of uh, letting our water by the billions of gallons, actually by the trillions of gallons, wash aimlessly and wastefully out to the sea is is a uh, massive, um, uh, I don't know how I want to call it, water crime against the people of California. There's um, a million acres of farmers, ranchers, um, orchard creators, and um, uh, uh, vineyards that have been um, purposely destroyed by the um, the, the California um, um, I, I, I'm, I don't know exactly what to call the the group, but it's it's the uh, the the uh, the water um, California Water Resources Control Board um, and and um, uh, j just letting the water wash aimlessly and uselessly to the sea by the trillions of gallons, uh, I'm sure isn't the exact desire of everybody on the board here, but it, it, ha it has been happening. And um, I'm a lifelong Democrat, but I grew up in farm farm country and ranch country, and these guys know what the heck they're doing. They know about the environment. They know about protecting the land. They know about protecting the water for their farms and ranches and animals. Um, so anyway, uh, I don't mean to be um, taking too much time here. I know you have plenty of other people, but I just thought I'd add my um, my comment. Thank you ever so much. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. All right, let's go back and see if we can bring up uh, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson is no longer on the Zoom platform. Okay. Um, so the next person would be Coolier Cocker, from, who is a former Tulare County Supervisor. Mr. Crocker, are you with us? Good. Right there. Good afternoon. I'm Kyler, I'm Kyler Crocker, a former Tulare County Supervisor and the first uh, Latino elected to the Board of Supervisors here in Tulare County. I live in Strathmore and have to purchase uh, bottled water um, due to high nitrates uh, in my areas. Uh, the San Joaquin Valley is home to many disadvantaged communities, including my own. Uh, communities that not only suffer from extreme poverty, but also from water quantity and quality issues. I worked closely with East Porterville, uh, Strathmore, Lindsay, Tuleyville, Tonyville, Seville, Yenham, Orosi, Teveston, Kettleman City. Oh, some of these communities may be familiar to board and staff. Uh, our communities need additional surface water. With the last two drought years, groundwater has been severely of surface supply. These communities receive water from both ground and surface supplies. Any reduced surface water supplies in the San Joaquin Valley would mean higher reliance on groundwater, which don't necessarily meet drinking water standards. It also would mean overdrafting the aquifer and having domestic and municipal wells go dry. Wells going dry would result in building new infrastructure where water affordability is already a huge challenge. The board needs to place a high priority in filling the San Luis Reservoir 
as so many communities rely on it. I urge the board and executive director and staff to take a balanced approach to water deliveries that takes into account California's most vulnerable communities. This is critical for our region, but this is also very personal for me. I've heard a lot of testimony about other disadvantaged communities, but I think there's a critical part in the Southern San Joaquin Valley that really needs uh, additional surface water supply to flow um, so that we can meet the, the basic needs uh, of our communities. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have um, Justin Friedrichsen from the California Farm Bureau Federation. Well, good afternoon, can you hear me? Hopefully I'm on an iPhone in a car. Yes. Sorry about that. Yeah, um, we I'm can just, hear oh, Great. I'm, I'm, so I'm, uh, I'm Justin Fredrickson. I'm a water and environmental policy analyst at the California Farm Bureau. And I just wanted to jump in real quick because, um, well, a lot of this is, I feel like a little bit premature. It's, it's somewhat too early to, to call what, what the rest of the water year is going to look like as, there, as um, the experts were highlighting earlier today. And we hope it will be better, but, but it could go either way at this point. Uh, and yet, uh, I just wanted to inject a little bit of a different opinion than a lot of the um, comments we've been hearing so far today. Uh, and I, I should also be clear that um, at, at the California Farm Bureau, we are the statewide you know, largest agricultural uh, association in, in, in the state of California. And we have members all up and down the state, which means that we also have members on all sides of this TUCP issue. So I'm going to try and engage my comments to hit it down, down the middle and not uh, you know, not, not hit any of those nerves that, um, uh, th they come up between different regions who are all competing for, you know, the same limited amount of water. Um, but I, uh, so a couple of things I wanted to say is, um, uh, so, so for farming, um, for one thing is there's, there's last year, 2021 agriculture pretty much statewide as the water board well knows was already pretty much cut to the bone. And so there's, there seems to be this misconception that um, the farmers are getting tons of water and, and um, at the expense of the fish and the, the, and the environment, the EJ communities and the, and everybody else. Um, and it's just not real because the, the fact is that uh, it would be hard to cut it any, uh, any lower than it already was last year. That, that would be hard to conceive of. And so I just wanted to kind of, um, put that out there when when people talk about pain sharing and saying that you know suggesting that rich farmers someplace are getting tons of water it's just it's not real every uh the a lot of the export contractors particularly south of delta are getting zero and if it weren't for groundwater uh, and we have sigma still coming up 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 to ramping up over the next many years uh there would be no water for for many of these farms and farm the farms are what provide us our food supply. So it's not really a luxury. It's not something that we can toggle on and off or that we can um, uh, just act as if it's not an essential and um, extremely important thing to our society as a whole, right? So um, I, I wanted to push back a little bit on that point where um, I, I was you know, reading through the petition and uh, a lot of the, what, what is being advocated for there is uh, cutting water even, even further even to the, the limited amounts that are getting to the, just the, the most senior contract, um, not contractors, but water users, including contractors who are the old riparians in the system, uh, cutting uh, transports, cutting exports even lower than where they already are, which was almost at zero. They're so slow that if they are so low that if they cut them back any further, the, the pumps will literally break. Uh, and so uh, it's, uh, I, I would su submit that that's, that's not really balanced. It's overly draconian. The water board's um, duty is to, is to balance among uh, beneficial uses. Um, and uh, 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 some important things to consider there include um, looking at efficient use of a limited resource, uh, the a causal connection, the outcomes that we're going to get for committing water to one thing or another, whether it's really going to make much of a difference because there are points of diminishing returns and there are also physical realities of feasibility issues as to whether you can, you know, provide 55 or 54 degree water on the floor of the valley in the middle of the summer 
in a very dry year with very little snowpack. Is that even really possible? And is the blame uh, um, fairly placed there? I would submit that it's not. Um, and uh, so another thing I wanted to highlight is the, the IOP, the, the interim operations plan that's tied up in the litigation and still up in the air and they're and they're uh the parties on are coming down on different sides of that it has to be yet to decided by the court and i think that is an appropriate call for the court primarily not for the water board but one of the things that's very concerning in that currently proposed um, interim operations plan is that it talks about no deliveries to agriculture of cvp water whatsoever until mid-april or may the earliest that we could have a temperature plan approved by the water board which for farmers doesn't work too well because you have to get your plan, you have to plan, you know, what your season's going to look like, get your crops planted and, and know what water you're going to have to, to get through the rest of the summer. So uh, just to put that out there, that's a bit of a big deal when you say that would mean no irrigation season. So um, I'm just going to uh, end it there, but I, I appreciate the opportunity to comment and I just uh, um, invite the board to, do it what it always does to consider this this very challenging the task it has of, of appropriately balancing among all the beneficial uses out there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Vice Chair, yes. uh, Mr. Thompson is back in the platform, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask him to unmute. And uh, if there we have a problem with it, we might wanna ask him again to not show his camera. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just going to keep my camera off for this uh, just to minimize chances of another interruption. Um, I'll start by repeating my last sentence. Um, I want to talk about how the quality of life of those who are unhoused and low income um, in our community and living along the waterways is directly tied to the water quality and quantity. Um, in 2019, the San Joaquin County point in time um, count identified it, identified 921 unhoused residents. Since then, due to events like the pandemic and affordable housing crisis, that number has grown tremendously and is believed to be around 5,000. Now, we won't have an exact number on that until the current point in time count that is underway right now as we speak um, wraps up. But one thing that we do know is that more and more um, of our unhoused community or low income community are moving towards the waterways in order to escape scrutiny from the police and from others in the community in order to be left alone. Them living along the waterways puts these individuals at a higher danger of being exposed to HABs than others in our community. This cannot be overlooked by the DWR, USBR, or other water boards or the water boards. Gutting Delta water quality standards in order to export too much water from the Delta is a symbol of California's failed water management practices. We can share the water for health, human safety, drinking water, and sanitation, but gutting Delta water quality standards through the proposed temporary urgent change petitions for industrial agriculture is not fair to Delta communities. It's not fair to those who are unhoused living along the waterways. Both unhoused and housed in, um, and house folks, actually, it's not fair to either. Industrial economies in the San Joaquin Valley are built on a system of inequities. It is clear that underrepresented communities in the Delta have been and continue to be forgotten in these processes. I am asking that we do not gut water quality standards and that we acknowledge the communities in the Delta who have to live with the outcome in the future. Thank you for the opportunity to comment and apologies for the interruptions. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. All right, um, I'm just looking here. Uh, I think our last speaker is Gloria Al Alonzo with Restore the Delta. We actually have one more after Gloria, and that would be um, Sarah Wolf. Okay. But Gloria will be next. Um, good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Gloria Alonso Cruz. I am with Restore the Delta. I am an undocumented college student at Sacramento State and a community member at Stockton. I am commenting today in regards to the inadequate water planning and management that continues to impact my community's health and diversity. The decisions to go water quality standards for the Delta impact the livability of our disadvantaged communities in several ways. 
And when I say this, I also want to include that several other underrepresented communities depend on healthy rivers connected to the Delta for their livelihoods. During the past year, I got to work with the Respiratory Delta team to understand one of the disasters that continue to impoverish our waterways due to poor water management practices and their adaptability to the demands of climate change. We began to track harmful algal blooms hotspots during the heat wave season in the Stockton community. We were able to archive photographic evidence of the hotspots identified and even become familiar with water quality testing with support from Region 5. I testified before this board about the alarming findings in regards to the density and proximity of HAPs to disadvantaged communities. Our work will continue this year to test water quality in those hotspots to construct to construct a comprehensive overview of how these water management practices deteriorate our waterways and impact populations, populations living adjacent to it, such as the unhoused community, like uh, Sonny Thompson mentioned. Practices such as, an ex, uh, such as excess water exports and lack of incoming flows will continue to interrupt fish migration and contribute to HAPS, just as other community activists mentioned. As climate change and hotter temperatures become something that we're required to include to the equation to conduct proper and adequate water management, it is important to continue questioning the integrity and purpose of the temporary barriers and who they are benefiting if the underrepresented communities and wildlife have not been thoroughly considered. Regardless of the testimonies that have been shared in past meetings from activists and community members. These practices are definitely not adequate. And if we want to preserve diversity and protect communities from being displaced by disasters that we are capable of foreseeing right now, then it is important to protect the Delta water quality and it must become a priority. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Ms. Alonzo. All right. Um, our last speaker is Sarah Wolf. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for giving me an opportunity Hello. to speak. Sarah Wolf with uh, WaterWise. I represent um, a number of farmers and uh, disadvantaged communities and just members of the community in the Southern San Joaquin Valley, primarily in the Westlands Water District area, as well as Madera County, where I work um, actively with many of those residents on ensuring that they have water supplies and water supplies for their farms. And I just wanna, it's been said multiple times today already, but just reiterate the human impact of these decisions and um, not to let it be forgotten that you know, there are many contractors in the San Joaquin Valley that are received solely their drinking water supply through this, um, through the Delta system. And the importance of them receiving that supply is you know, critical. I look primarily to the city of Huron, who this year had their CBP contract supply cut drastically. And by um, early contract year, I believe it was by May, they had already run out of the limited supply that they had. They were able to receive some grant funding to drill a well, which unfortunately is, um, is it is good in that they will have a backup, but it is bad that it's, it will continue to exacerbate our groundwater problem but they need that to have a supply of any kind. The neighboring farmers have been able to supply them with some existing well water, but they have been surviving since May without a water supply. And going into next year, um, they will be in a very similar situation. And these are residents that can't afford um, expensive water and have very limited resources other than the CVP supply. And they're, Huron's just one example of many of the communities in the San Joaquin Valley that receive their water this way. So just as a reminder that your decision on this um, TUCP affects actual small disadvantaged communities immediately. And so I, I hope that that is taken into consideration when you are making these decisions because it is really human beings that are impacted. And somebody said it earlier and it's so true. There are many, many beneficial users of this water supply and we have to think of all of their needs and all of the impacts to that before we make um, unilateral decisions based on one of those beneficial users. So I just encourage you to make sure that you, you look at all of the beneficial users when making the decision. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, much appreciated. Okay, with that, um, Ms. Townsend, no other um, 
individuals no, who signed up? No, I have no other. Okay. So um, at this point, um, I just want to check with, I know it's been a long day, but um, want to make sure that we have an opportunity as a board to ask any uh, additional questions of staff or to um, dialogue amongst ourselves. So um, just want to turn it over to my colleagues. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, chime in here for a moment. Yeah, this has been a really helpful um, day. And I'm certainly looking forward to um, the written comments here uh, that are due in a couple of days. So I'm sure there's much more information to come. And you know what we've learned is we certainly don't have all the answers. And, um, but there has been a resounding chorus of a need for transparency about the work that's being done here to chart whatever path forward that we're going to embark on with the TUCPs or, or whatever operational strategy this um, water year requires of, of us. And so I wanna go back to some of the earlier conversations um, since yeah, the TUCP, the operations, the temperature management plan, now the interim operations plan, all of these pieces are um, interrelated, right? Um, disorders combines, it's hard to separate these things. Um, and so, you know, last year we talked during the temperature management plan discussions, we talked quite a bit about um, the rapid assessment testing, um, modeling from, from NIMS and other modeling tools. And I think uh, Thad Bentner mentioned that earlier uh, this morning in his comments. And that's just one example, uh, you know, of information that it, I mean, we're hearing from stakeholders from, from both sides. Uh, that there's a, a need and a desire for that type of information to be shared in a timely manner so it can be used to help inform these types of tough decisions and trade-offs. So I was wondering, um, Ms. Riddle or others, if you could just, uh, we've probably asked you this before, but if you could just chime in and refresh my memory uh, about where that stands. It's been many months now since um, we've had that conversation. Um, where, where are we on that as, a, as just an example of one piece of information that might be helpful? Um, sure. I, I guess maybe I will clarify in terms of the rapid assessment tool that was used ultimately. So that's a, a quick way to assess a number of scenarios together. It, it is followed by honing in on the scenarios that you may want to explore more with full modeling. So. Last year, we used that tool early on. In the end, there was full modeling. I think all of that modeling was made available to um, you know I, the settlement contractors. There were separate meetings, meet and confer meetings with them. I think they you know had access to that information. Um, we fully appreciate that in the future we need to develop a robust process to get out information timely. Um, in terms of doing a peer review on the um, on the uh, rapid assessment tool, that is something we've talked about. It's still that still needs to be pursued. We don't have the fish agency staff on now. We can be sure to provide you an update on that. But I did want to clarify that that's kind of the um, the quick overarching tool that allows you to look at you know, hundreds of different scenarios, if not more together, and then do the more full and complete modeling, which was done and I think will continue to be done. And we will continue to work with um, the Southwest Fishery Science Center to ensure that the basis for that model and the and necessary reviews occur for that model. Yeah, thank you. I, I just I think that's an example of products that are in development, and yet you know there's there's clearly a benefit and a usefulness to it to that tool. Um, you know, but at the same time, the information is kind of comes out in real time as we're trying to make these same decisions. That's what we experienced last year. Mm -hmm. I think you know my concern would be that we're in that same mode again this year. Um, but I understand the complexities there and the challenges of, of getting all that done. And thank you for following up on that. 
Yeah, we can um, we can perhaps ask as part of the January 18th update, we can be sure to follow up with more information on that tool in particular and other modeling activities. We did um, associated with the 2022 TUCP request the hydrologic information that supported the biological reviews that were included with the 2022 TUCP. We sent that out, posted on our website last night. Um, <clears throat> We do understand the DWR and Reclamation may be producing some more analyses. Uh, obviously, once they have better, the updated hydrologic information, that's really changed the landscape. We'll also make sure that that information is made available to inform the decisions and available to the public can continue to coordinate with DWR on that front. Okay, thank you. That's all I have right now. Thank you, Board Member McGuire. Anyone else? Board Member Firestone? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, first I have a couple of questions just for staff kind of circling back on big picture from the initial framing presentation. Um, so we, you know, we discussed and heard that um, we're gonna have a workshop on impacts to fish um, from this past year. And we had the study from DWR on HABs links to the TUCP. Um, and I know in both the presentation and the draft order, we have some numbers on the the estimated storage savings from the TUCP. Um, so I guess I'm I I'm just wanting to make sure. Oh, and also on it looked like um, human health and safety. We, we had some information in the draft order um, that we received from reporting on to inform. Um, kind of minimum exports needed for human health and safety or made for human health and safety, exports made for human health and safety and then other uses. Um, and we're asking for more details on that if, you know, going forward. Um, I, I guess I just, I wanna, you know, I think we all would agree that um, the outcomes from this, past year um, from, you know, including from what was intended by both the TUCP and temperature management plan weren't accomplished. Like that was very much um, not the, not a reasonable outcome. <laughs> and so I, I wanna understand, you know, one more just understanding um, what we've, what the outcomes were and making sure we really uh, are getting clear information on what were the impacts on fish, what were the impacts on HABs, um, what were the impacts in particular on um, low-income communities, communities of color, um, and indigenous communities. Because um, I think that's part of us making sure that we're learning from this past year and able to incorporate that into the balancing for next year. There's some really good um, conditions in our draft order to help us have better information going into any future TUCP or temperature management plan and making sure we're, we're in a different place information wise, um, which is really important. I, I think in addition to that information, um, one, you know, I, I would love to have us pull out a little bit better um, how, what information we're asking for to help us understand better um, disproportionate impacts and outcomes on communities of color and tribal communities. Cause I think that's something that we have um, been clear that we are committed to um, understanding within the decisions that we make. So I wanna make sure we're able to get that as well. Um, so I guess in, if you can just go help me understand 
you know, where we are getting that assessment of um, the outcomes and impacts of the TCP and, and temperature management plan. Um, it sounds like we're gonna have a workshop coming up. You know, we didn't have a presentation from fisheries today, but we have some of the information that we referred to and you all referred to, we heard a bit about today. So can you just tell us more about when we will be getting that overview um, or workshop or information, whether it's not in a workshop or somewhere else? Yeah, um, well, maybe, so in terms of fishery related impacts, we did have the fishery agencies here for questions. They didn't actually have any presentations today. We can ask them as part of the informational item um, on the 18th to provide a little more information if you'd like for us to do that. Um, we have been, certainly staff has been tracking the impacts to fish and wildlife and didn't mean to give that short shrift. We were trying to keep our presentation sort of condensed to make sure we're focused on the public comments that we're receiving. So we certainly understand that issue um, and understand the new information that has come out recently on um, the juvenile production estimates for winter and Chinook salmon um, and you know how that bears on the decisions that we've made. Um, and are considering all of that information and, you know, really the goal of the conditions in the draft order on reconsideration was to try, the major goal was to try to provide for transparency um, in understanding what all the different trade-offs are um, in terms of understanding the um, equity, equity related effects to native communities and communities of color. I think you have to put several pieces of information together, including the comments that we're receiving from the public in writing and, and verbally here today, and also understanding, you know, what is water quality effects, the HAB issues in the Delta, aquatic weed issues in the Delta, um, those the issues associated with native fish populations and those that are dependent upon those populations or culturally important um, species to different, different communities um, in California. So that's a more complex um, set of circumstances, I think, to put together. We certainly are thinking about all of those things that, you know, it, it's a good point that perhaps that's something that would merit a more explicit call out of that consideration in the draft order. So we can certainly um, consider adding that. I think um, we may, based on what we hear today, we may propose some additional edits to the conditions to try to continue to build on this transparency, clarity, timely information so that we're better informed in our drought planning decisions as we move forward. That, you know, that really is the goal of the order. The, the TUCP actions from last year and temperature management plan actions have passed. So really the focus is the, what did we learn from what occurred last year? How can we improve upon the decision-making process, the information exchange, those sorts of things. So um, we'll definitely take what we heard here today and try to um, refine the proposed conditions in the draft order to um, ensure that we're fully accounting for um, the issues that we heard today. Yeah, I appreciate that and agree. I feel like there was really, as everyone said, really, really helpful comments today. Um, and look forward to the comments in writing. In the order, you know, we are, as you said, we're asking for information. Um, we haven't previously been asking for information on disproportionate impacts and particularly looking at impacts to um, indigenous communities and communities of color, low-income communities. I, I do think it's important for us to request that to inform it, our decisions. Um, and I think that the methodology of what that means um, is something that needs to continue to evolve. So I know we may not have the perfect answer um, as to um, as to kind of the methodology and how to do that. But I, you know, certainly we need to start. <laughs> we need to require. Um, require some analysis of that. And, and as you said, I think part of that really does need to be um, engagement and listening to those communities that we wanna understand disproportionate impacts on. <laughs> um, so that's you know not just a, um, 
not just a, a data analysis, although um, I think we should be bringing those resources in as well. So, um, yeah, I would appreciate that. You know, I, I would hope that we would add something there and just continue to work with the Bureau and DWR around what that means and what that could look like, um, how we can support that kind of um, analysis and better understanding to, to support our decision making. Um, and, I, you know, I, I mentioned, I am really interested in trying to understand better. And we, we I think both um, Vice Chair Diadamo and I kind of asked for more information on this um, kind of complex issue of what does human health and safety deliveries mean? Um, so I do really look forward to hearing and understanding that better. I know that was something we have in our, um, in our requirement, in, in one of the draft conditions. Um, I think it's a really important conversation. You know, yesterday we were talking about emergency conservation. You know, there's um, in curtailments, we're talking about um, human health and safety. We have human health and safety definitions as sort of default um, 55 gallons per person per day. Um, I just would like, I feel like we need a space to be able to really start to um, dig into what does that mean, um, especially as unfortunately we find ourselves more and more getting to that limit and figuring out how that needs to be defined. So um, look forward to that. And I, I think that's um, an important discussion. appreciate that that was I appreciate that and many of the other things that were in the draft order and um, yeah, just look forward. I really, I, I found the comments here incredibly valuable and I really appreciate the, the time and work in this and look forward to also the update at the next meeting. Yeah, I, I'll just maybe add following on your comments that um, the, it would be helpful, the written comments are due on Friday if, um, some of the folks that spoke here today or others have suggestions for um, metrics or ways that we should be looking at um, disproportionate impacts to different communities. We'd appreciate that input. Again, it's a tricky issue um, to fully assess because it, you know, the mechanisms for impacts could manifest in a lot of different ways and different communities. Um, so if, if, our stakeholders have input on that, we'd be interested in that for sure. Thank you, board member Firestone. Anything else? Okay. Any other comments? I'll just remember Morgan. Yeah, I'll just, I just want to just quickly thank everyone for the informative, um, one for the informative presentations and then also the discussion and the comments. Um, you know, there, there's a lot to lot discussed today, a lot of great input. Um, and, you know, just I too, looking forward to the written comments. And um, as Ms. Real just said, you know, if there are specific um, changes that are, you know, being requested, those can be put in writing. Um, that's just always very helpful to see that, um, any suggestions. And then, um, just you know, as we go, as we're moving forward, I um, the the next upcoming update and just future. It's good to see just everyone coming together to collaboratively work on this, and I would like to see more of that as we move forward. Of just looking out to see what other information is available, and bringing that into the the process, because that way we have um, just the most. We're, we're using the the available information that is there um, and we have that way we are expanding our database and able to better inform our decisions as we move forward. So just wanted to thank the collaboration that's already occurring and encourage us to continue to look for um, other groups to continue to collaborate with. Thank you for that board member Morgan. So um, uh, just in wrapping up, I, I have a few comments and questions um, in addition, and just um, first of all, keying off of something that board member Morgan just uh, said about ongoing collaboration. 
Um, I, I am, um, you know, anxious about those opportunities as well. Um, it just really strikes me that, uh, in particular, in this area of temperature management, um, uh, specific targets, and um, um, our effort to uh, uh, obtain additional information about contract deliveries with the potential of uh, maybe uh, imposing some additional conditions there on water supply, in particular the seniors. I think it's important for us to, um, and we're moving in that direction of being more transparent and having an open dialogue. Um, I can't help but recall um, some of these similar uh, conversations back in 2014 and 2015, and we were on such a rapid pace moving quickly, especially with the delegated authority that the executive director had. And I just really appreciate this um, additional time that we have to be able to have this discussion. And I think that we should just use that to, um, um, to our advantage um, and to the public's advantage to be able to have an open dialogue. And unfortunately, just because we don't have all that information just yet, we weren't able to, I think several speakers did a good job of kind of framing the issue for us. Gary Bobker, John McManus, Justin, Justin Friedrichsen, they all did a really good job about, you know, talking about, um, you know, sort of that, that those issues of trade-offs. Um, but what we weren't able to do was hear from the fishery agencies about their view and their modeling and the information that they have and for us and the public to be able to ask questions about, you know, is that really, uh, are, are those impacts related to a lack of carryover storage or could it be some other factors at play um, if contract deliveries were to be impacted what what does that mean in terms of trade-offs and balancing you know all of the beneficial uses and so um, i do appreciate that we're going to receive some additional information on january 18th but really looking for um, uh, ongoing opportunity for the public to be engaged, um, not looking for, uh, I, I know Barry Nelson said we should have additional briefings. I do want additional briefings, uh, including regarding fishery impacts, but what I want even more than that is to hear the public dialogue, um, because otherwise we're receiving, um, you know, briefing from one agency or organization as opposed to um, all of us hearing that in an open session. So just to the extent that uh, those conversations can be teed up and Ms. Riddle getting information out in advance so that uh, the public can come prepared to um, be able to comment. Um, I think that would be helpful. And um, it, um, as far as the um, fisheries um, workshop in um, March, do you have a date for that? We don't have a date yet. Um, we are, this topic has evolved over the holidays and we still need to, I think, be in contact with key presenters to ensure that they're available, but probably more toward the middle or end of March versus the beginning of March. And we will be sure to um, get a notice out as soon as possible, as soon as we can get some of that core organization done and solidify a date. And I think board member McGuire talked about this, you know, receiving information in real time and where that comes into play on our decision making. But to the extent that this additional precip has um, provided some, you know, maybe space in terms of urgency for, for the petition, um, uh, I would um, welcome the opportunity to receive that information be before decisions are made. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else? Before we close out, Mr. Loeffler, um, I'd be uh, ready to adjourn, but just want to check with you if there's anything else that I'm missing here. No, you're good to go, Vice Chair Diodamo. Okay. Well, thank you all. Thank you to the public. Thank you, staff, very much. I know you worked on this over the holidays and we got those <laughs> late emails. Um, even when I think some of you were on vacation. So uh, thank you for your uh, good work on this and thanks to the public for being so engaged and giving us um, a good input today. And we will see you all in a couple of weeks. Thank you. <laughs>